There's no time. Here we are again, and it's episode 157. Yeah, this is going to be an interesting one. We- <laughs> Why'd you say it like that? <laughs> yes, it is. This is. You know, I've been hearing this one off and on my whole fucking life. Yeah, me too. I remember this one from like In Search Of. I know, and I rewatched In Search yeah. Of today, just like the yeah. episode about it. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody it, put it on YouTube. Yeah, it's an interesting uh, case. It is. It's yeah. a, and this was actually a re- uh, recommendation by one of our YouTube listeners. This is the Lost Dutchman's Mine. Yeah. And other kind of mysterious shit around yeah. the Superstition Mountains. Because a lot of people go missing. Uh, In the Superstition Mountains. Yeah. It's like some old West shit, you know? It is old West shit. Yeah. But yeah, so a lot of people like go missing and turn yeah. up murdered and they find like skulls with bullet yeah. holes in them and shit like that. And there's supposed to be a curse, too. So there's yeah, you, that there's that whole thing. It's like something you'd see Clint Eastwood doing. <laughs> walking around, good and bad and the ugly. Looking has anybody me. has anybody made a, like a horror movie based on the Lost Dutch in mind? I know I've seen like a couple of know. documentaries about it, but I I feel like that would make like kind of I a don't movie. know, there might not be enough there. Well, I don't know. You can make so? a horror movie out of all about kinds anything. of things. So I don't know. That Bone might be... Tomahawk would probably be pretty close. That's true. We yeah. need to do a review of that one yeah. of these days because I've It's another Crustle movie. Because, uh, yeah, that, and that was really Russell good. Movie, it, yeah. it really is great. Because uh, didn't I buy you that for Christmas yep. or your birthday or something like that? Yeah, a Western horror starring Crossell. Yeah. At, and, he's, and he's in his element. Yeah. Yeah. They should make more horror westerns. I guess they yeah. make some. Like, one of my favorite ones is Ravenous, actually. Which yeah. I guess isn't a Western western because it's actually set during a different war book. All right. So, like I said, this was a request... And this was something that, again, like, you know, I saw a lot of in fucking, uh, you know, on documentaries and stuff on TV back in the day, all those, like, creepy, mysterious kind of things. So this is something I had kind of forgotten about. And then when I started reading about it, I'm like, oh, yeah, I remember all of this kind of stuff. But before we get to that, let's uh, do a couple of shout outs. Yeah. Uh, we One of our patrons, Liam, uh, increased his support this week. So yeah. thank to you what? very much. What's he? What's he? What's he? I, I don't remember. Yeah, offhand. okay. He's got that big bucks. <laughs> he's got that big bucks. I don't remember offhand. I yeah, don't I, usually write the amounts down. I usually yeah. just write the, the names kind of down. Keep it down low. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Keep it on the DL. Keep it down yeah. low. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. And also, um, if you didn't notice, I mentioned on our show last week, but Faceless Villain Volume Three is now available for sale. <sighs> yeah. It's it's in print and ebook formats. The audiobook format, um, all the files have been uploaded and f- about a week ago, and they're undergoing like quality control. So right. I imagine it'll probably be like another week, and that should be available as well. Yeah. So I might actually, I made like a little commercial for it, and I might put it in this episode. But and I think the commercial says that the audiobook version is available, but it probably won't be for like another week or so. Right. But the print and ebook it'll are. Be there are available and i'll put like a link down in the description yeah and her collection of uh fiction is finished just got to do the audio recording yeah i read compiled the book looks really good oh thanks yeah Yeah, i redid the i'm doing like a second edition of Mm -hmm. uh i'm doing the associated villainies first if any of y'all have read that one it's like a you know short stories and um i basically redesigned the cover i redid the layout Um, I added three or four more stories to the end. So I'm doing like a second edition of it. Yeah. And um, eventually it's going to have an audiobook version too. I just haven't got around to recording it. And once that one's out, any of our um, uh, patrons... We we can send them a free audio book on the on that one. And yeah. You know, uh, as a perk there. Yeah. As long as you guys uh, give a review on it, it's it's going to be good though. It's, you know, if you if you like those old kind of like Stephen King short story uh, compilations, it's like that. But she's kind of more like Clive Barker, if you ask me. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's pretty gross. It's cool. Though. <laughs> cool people one like, story in particular because i hadn't read them in a while because some of them were kind of old and like i was reading them yeah. and i was like wow that's pretty disgusting i can't believe i wrote yeah. that <laughs> all this stuff had to, it's never been available before on audiobook and, yeah you know, it all had to be kind of repackaged and relaunched into easier to buy chunks 
You know what I mean? So everything was big enough. We wanted everything to be at least 400 pages worth of material. So these will be a lot easier to buy than buying a bunch of little ones. It's going to sell well. Yeah, I, I feel like I wanted to take, because, you know, and I think I mentioned this on a show like a while back, but I wanted to take, I have so many like unpublished like short stories and like, you know, just little bits of things that never got published or got published in like old anthologies that maybe people didn't read. And I was like, you know, I really want to do like a, just a little series of fiction books that are just yeah. like, you know, novels or novellas or yeah. compilations of short stories. And I want them to all be sort of like a series. I want them all to be 400 pages. Yeah. So you feel like you're getting your money, money's worth. And I want them all to eventually have um, audiobook covers. So yeah. that's so that's my project that I'm working on now. The first one, like I said, is going to be Associated Villainies, which even if you have the original version, this is going to have it's an all new cover. Like I said, there's some different stories in it. And um, it's going to have an audiobook version, and then after that, I'm going to yeah. do Hopeful Monsters, and then I'm going to see what I'm going to do from there. Yeah, and the audiobook read is going to be real entertaining on this one. This isn't, isn't going to be kind of dry or clinical like some of the older, you know, paranormal type books, like in, uh, you know that were in the past where you kind of had to be, play it a little straight. Jenny will be able to kind of act up, and it'll be probably be more about like the, listening to this show, probably. Yeah, I, I mean, think. because it's fiction, so you can do it. Like, I'm not going to do wacky voices or anything no, no. like that. But I was like, yeah. I'm not going that far, but, you know. It's not. fiction. It's all about entertainment. Yeah, so I yeah. might like it. So it might be, like, kind of livelier and shit mm -hmm. like that. But we'll see how it goes. So that's kind of, that's something I'm going to be working on over the next couple of months. Yeah. So are we ready to talk about the Lost Dutchman Mine? Um, yeah. You didn't have anything else you needed um, to? Let me think. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, he did. Yeah, somebody uh, commented saying that uh, uh, the show is suffering because of the al drinking the alcohol. Uh oh. So uh, I blocked his ass. Now the show's really <laughs> suffering for him. Don't fuck with me. I, I got a bad temper. All right. If you don't like the show, just don't watch it. You know, if you're up there fucking Well, that's a very shit, easy thing that some people don't really seem they to be doing. It. They don't understand it. I'll <laughs> shut that shit. Before we were just taking take a comment down. But I, shit, I can get vindictive. I'll fucking ban your ass. Yeah. Block the shit out of you. I guess I can do that. It's I not, just I have fun with it. I don't really care, I don't care that either. much about don't stupid care people like that. I don't care. <laughs> well, you know, the men mentally ill people have to make comments every now and then. <laughs> I guess. Yeah, Maybe it keeps them out of trouble. Keeps them out of trouble or something. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what it is. I don't know. I don't know. But yeah. Let's so, go ahead and do the show. All right. So now are you ready? Okay. Yeah. So like I said, this was... Oh, wait a minute. Hold on. i got oh. to mention, mention something else. Uh -oh. Going into intense, intense study for the martial arts paranormal show that we're doing. That will probably be the next That'll one. That will probably be the next one. He's very excited about this. Yeah, I'm very he was, excited. He was like showing me all these videos and I'm, stuff yesterday. Yeah, videos and all kinds of other stuff and, and, and historical documentation that I found online, I guess. I guess you could say it's historical. There's not a whole lot that I'm not sure is actually legitimate in a lot of this martial arts stuff, but it is very entertaining. Martial yeah, arts history some of those is videos, that, some of those videos that you showed me, especially yeah. that one guy, I was just yeah, like, some, some, wow. Yeah, well, I was show, I showed her the the videos of a martial art master known as Ashita Kim, and he used to sell videos uh, to his students. Through comic books, I guess, yeah, and Black Belt magazine. The the, yeah. And man, he's we're gonna we're wow. gonna have little clips of some of these trading videos. If I if he doesn't sue me, he's still alive, right? He can, I don't think he can sue you. It's fair. It's fair. Uh, uh, it's fair usage. Okay. It's fair usage. <laughs> Even if we're making fun of him. <laughs> we don't have to make fun of those. We can just show them. Yeah, you really you they, they, they need them. no further comment. No. <laughs> I mean, you they can just really show them. Don't. I was just like, seriously. Yeah, he was one of the greatest martial artists. And then I kind of wonder if like people back then, like some little kid like ordered it from the back of a comic book. It was like even like it was so long ago, like would you feel ripped off or would you be like, Yeah, man, epic. I think they, I'd have felt ripped off. They didn't know any better. Although my buddy Jim, he was all into that shit. He probably would have loved that shit, eat it up. And, That's what I mean. If you're super teenager. into that stuff and yeah. you're a kid and it was yeah. like the 80s or whatever yeah. it was and you didn't know any better. The ninja craze of the 80s. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, they might not have felt ripped off It well. was during the satanic panic, too. Man. But the ninjas never got ninjas never got accused of being Satanists. Ain't hmm. that something? I wonder why. I don't know. I get those two things don't really have anything to do with each other. Although most they've of the things got they got dragons, they're mo wearing most black. Of, most of the things they accused of being satanic yeah, didn't have anything to do with it either. 
shit. No, I'm actually surprised now that you mentioned it. I'm surprised yeah. that shit didn't get dragged into oh, it. Oh, man, they, you look at a ninja, you could say that guy was satanic. Yeah, he's, he's black, black and, and he can do like dragons shit. and he's trying to kill people and yeah. I guess so. Worships the devil. <laughs> not a Christian. Yeah, because he's not, he's not even from here. He's a heathen. <laughs> All right, let's stop fucking around. Gotta get, <laughs> right. gotta get to this story. Yeah, that'll be that's a little teaser of next week's show, I guess. Because, yeah. like I said, he's very. excited. I'm gonna talk about all the greats. So we decided to do this. Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna talk about all. That's the good because you've been doing research on this for like weeks and weeks, so it's like they'll yeah. take some of the burden off me, I guess. <laughs> gonna talk about Count Dante. Gonna talk about shit. Gonna talk about Frank Ducks or Dukes. Frank Dukes. Gonna talk about Bloodsport. Yeah. yeah. Gonna talk about. You talk about all kinds of people. You're yeah, gonna see it. They'll be super fun. Yeah. All right. But on this show, yeah. <laughs> we're gonna talk about the Superstition Mountains, and in particular, the legend of the Lost Dutchman Mine. Mm-hmm. And like I said, this area is supposed, also supposed to be cursed, like an Apache curse or something like that. So this is probably one of the best known. I wouldn't even say one of the best. This is the best known, like treasure hunt story like treasure curse story in American history. I think there's really not one better known than this, is there? Maybe not in America. Where's that one? What was that pirate treasure? And I think that was on an, an Captain island. Captain Kid. The one was that was on Captain an Kid? island and they thought that there was this damn shaft. Oh, uh, uh, Oak Island. Oak Island, yeah. yeah. I would say it's probably up there with kind of like Oak Island. Yeah, that's got a whole slick series about it. Yeah, they've been like digging to that. that same spot forever. There's nothing there. No, I think they no. would have found it by now. But, yeah. you know, makes a good series, I guess. Yeah. But I think the, well, the difference between Oak Island and this case was that this case has, one, some murders, and um, two, it has, like, that kind of, like, that Apache curse aspect okay, also. Yeah. Yeah. And also, like, people still go missing looking for this shit, even though technically you're not supposed to go looking for treasure in the Superstition Mountains anymore because it's, like, a protected area now. Okay. Um, but people still do it anyway, and they're still dragging people's carcasses out of there every now and then because they think they're, oh, I'm going to go find a treasure map, and I'm going to go, like, in here with Mm. no fucking water or not enough food. It's like, you know what I mean? There's just no hiking boots. (laughs) That that area won't sustain life for long. No, it definitely won't. Yeah, you just really can't. I mean, hardly anything grows there. It's just, like, all scrub, and it's just, you know, it's, like, hundreds and hundreds of degrees, like, hundred-something degrees in the day, and it's, like, freezing cold at night. And I think a lot of people go in there a little unprepared. Yeah. Um, so, you know, and they've been doing that for years and years. And like I said, a lot of them die and some of them disappear also. So, you know, and that kind of like, I think that kind of like um, plays into the whole mystique around the place because yeah. all these people go missing and it's like, oh, it's because the curse, I like think, all these people died. And stuff. I think this is kind of the area where a couple of convicts uh, they, they thought were out hiding out there went missing. Sometime in the 80s, in the early 80s, yeah. some guys were, I think they did a bank robbery, and during the, during the, uh, they had like a little shootout with the cops, so they got into a vehicle, and they were shooting out the back of it, and they got away. Yeah. Yeah, they had assault rifles and stuff. And uh, evidently, they were never seen or heard from again. Hmm. And uh, some people, there were some reports of somewhere in the desert, and I think it was around this area. They thought they saw two of them. They had rifles and everything, but they just looked like haggard old bums with huh. rifles, and they were trying to just evidently live off the land out there. Yeah, good luck Like with something that. out of Hills Have Eyes. <laughs> yeah. And they never found those guys again. I forgot the name, and I forgot all the details. I just remembered it now. Yeah. So, yeah somebody, somebody might know. In the, uh, like I said, a lot of people have disappeared. I mean, they yeah. found a lot of bodies. Like, they found a lot of skeletons and stuff out there, but, like, some people just said, hey, I'm going to find the Lost Dutchman mine, and then they never saw their asses again. Yeah. So, yeah, I think the last reports of those guys wandering around out in the desert, that was probably 90s. They, they'd probably be dead by now. Well, yeah, I would think. Yeah. Like, especially, unless but, they got the, found the fuck. They were never found yeah. again. Yeah. They're, you know, they're wanted men. And there are places where you could disappear in the United States and never be seen again. Well, yeah, there's lots of places a, like that. A desert wouldn't be a good place. Well, be no. Be, it'd be better to up in there in Washington State. Some of those national uh, national forests, well, forests and stuff. I You'd mean, desert is really never yeah. a pl- good place to do anything because you know, very hard to live off the land when there's hardly yeah. any animals. You could live plants. in that national forest though. Oh yeah, easily. Yeah, a lot easier. I mean, yeah, if you know what you were doing. You could just fish all year round if you had to. Yeah, and you know that's that seems like one of the easiest things to do. I don't know yeah. 
All right, so as I said, you know, other than Oak Island, this is probably the best known uh, kind of treasure tale from the Old West. Even though tales of it go way back to, you know, the Spanish conquistadors and even like before that. So the Lost Dutchman Mine, as it came to be called later on, uh, is actually a little bit east of Phoenix, Arizona, in the very coolly named Superstition Mountains. Now, there's one mountain that's just called Superstition Mountain, but then the whole range is called Superstition Mountains, too. Yeah. And then there's one kind of, like, peak, and that's called Weaver's Needle, and that usually comes up a lot when they're talking about the, lo- you know, the purported location of the mine, because some people said oh, it's in the shadow of Weaver's Needle and stuff like that, even though they've never... And some people have, like, tried to plow all the way through <laughs> Weaver's Needle, like, blast their way through it looking for this shit, and they've never found anything. So, all right. Now... Before, you know, anybody found gold or before any of the prospecting or anything like that, um, when the Spanish got to Arizona in around 1540, um, the area around the mountains was inhabited by the Apache Indians or Native Americans. Yeah, the Apaches were badasses, though. They were. Well, they think they might have killed a lot of the people that went in there looking for the gold. I don't remember exactly how old the Apache tribe were, but I do remember that the Apache weren't around for very long. They were actually made up out of three other tribes that had kind of got whittled down to next to nothing, and then a bunch of bandits mixed in with them. And they weren't around, but I think about 30 or 40 years, but uh, these guys were fucking awesome. Uh, They were really good ambush fighters out in the desert. Their trademark was fucking slavery. They enslaved other Indians, especially women. They were doing like white slavery and stuff, you know, with Indian women. You know, these were bad dudes. Uh, nobody liked them, evidently. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's no. fucking Apache. And uh, at the U.S. Army, with the aid of some other Indian tribes, supposedly hunted them down and kind of pacified them eventually. That was the story I remembered. Uh, they're still around, and I think uh, I think they actually might even have a reservation. But they're you're not talking the same. They're not really the same guys anymore. You know, they're not criminals or anything, of course. Um, well, yeah, it's I, I been think many generations. Been many generations. They, uh, I saw them on Ultimate Warrior. They were uh, they were doing like because yeah, they had some like Apache fighting techniques and yeah, shit. Yeah, whatever happened to that show? That was I a fun know. show. It's kind of fun. <laughs> I don't know how authentic it was. It's not, but it was but, like fun yeah. entertainment. But they had the Apaches out there doing their fucking shit and fucking with their knives and shit. You know, it was uh, it was pretty cool. You know, um, of course, you know we're talking about you know 1800s and you know these guys weren't fucking Stone Age. You know they they were also real. Uh, they traded with the Mexico a lot, so they had guns and knives and steel, and they were modern people. You know in those days they weren't far from. Yeah, you know, they showed on, on on these old westerns. You know, kind of like how the Indians and guys in the Wild West were like in a parallel universe is like the Indians are still yeah. in the Stone Age. No. Yeah, and they're like running around with loincloths yeah. and like throwing like, rocks no. at people and stuff. That's not it's how it was. Stupid. Indians had money. Yeah. Indians had money. They <laughs> they traded. They made money. You had rich Indians. You had Indians that wore clothes and had a shit ton of horses and some of the best fucking guns that you could buy, you know, repeating rifles and stuff. Uh, you know, they, they were fully aware of what the fuck was going on. They were, they were modern players in the game, you know. But, uh, yeah, you were Apache. And of course, you know, being U.S. Army, all of our badass shit was named after some kind of Indian tribe in honor <laughs> of their ferocity, like the Apache helicopter, you know? Yeah, well, yeah. And, and the Chinook, you know, and all that kind of stuff. Everything that's bad at U.S. Army, every, the motifs were always Indian. Yeah. Yeah, in honor of these motherfuckers. They'd fight. Yeah. yeah. Well, well like they were survivors, said, you know? They could survive yeah. in the field, you know? In a day where the white man couldn't feed himself in the field, you know, he's starving, you know, needed to help the Indians, you know, to teach him how to survive off the land, you know. So yeah, that's what it I was mean. All ma- it was all fucking man love and shit. Because it's so, they were like, these dudes are badasses. It's so hilarious because it's like, I remember when I was a little kid, I don't think they teach it like this anymore, but when I was yeah. a little kid, you know, the myth around Thanksgiving and stuff like in the United States was just like, oh, you know, the pilgrims, they shared their food with the Indians, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, no, yeah, it's kind of the other way, way around. around. <laughs> the Indians were teaching them how to survive. Yeah, because the people were like, oh, my God, there's yeah. like, what do you mean? We can't and do anything. When they had, when they had, a, to death. When they had their first big successful harvest, they shared it with the people that taught them how to grow it. Yeah. And th- that all those early colonies, if you look back into the records, they were all people that were mixed. They were Indians living with them that had converted to Christianity uh, they were having children together. Same with Salem, the whole Salem town, you know, where the Salem witch mm-hmm. trials went. 
you can look in the records and it was mostly an Indian town, really. And most of those, they had American names, but there just weren't enough people. There weren't enough women to marry. You married Indian women. Yeah, it's like, or, as always, you know, the history is a lot more yeah. complex and interesting. It was not brown and white. No. <laughs> or red and white. No, That's not what it was. Not. Definitely no. not. No, those towns were all mixed. Yeah. And there were black people in those towns. Well, like, not surprisingly, yeah. because everyone right. just kind of like... Right. You and were in were, a little bit of a hostile environment, right. particularly for the European settlers, so, mm -hmm. you know... You took the help you could get. You'd be stupid not to. Yeah, and uh, you know, all through the seven, sixteen, seventeen, and part of the eight, all through the sixteen and seventeen hundreds. Well, actually, you can go to the late fifteen hundreds. The white man li had to live as an Indian when he got here, basically. Yeah. You, you had to adapt their ways. That goes back to you know. Yeah, like I said, Indian. they've been here for thousands of years. Right. Your ass just got here. Right. So you better listen to the people that have right. lived here. There, no, there was no cultural power, really, <laughs> you know, until seventeen hundred, late seventeen hundreds, and then industrial revolution changed the game. And you know, you're going to hear all this shit about Indian genocide. There was a lot of battles, you know what I mean. Main thing was disease, and the disease was bought by the Spaniards in the fifteen hundreds. Yeah. So it was already kind of a post-apocalyptic. Yeah, I mean the population had been significantly diminished yeah, by the it, time bef from diseases, like from you disease, said, from the Spaniards. But before the first English colonies ever got here, and then they got there, you know, and one of the first guys they meet was Squanto, and he just got back from England. So you had Indians in England. Yeah. And they knew all, you know, they speak English and shit. So it was a more of a globalized world than people think it was, but disease had got most of them. And then uh, there's a bunch of tr trading alliances and, 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 and wars and inbreeding, or excuse me, a lot of outbreeding. Uh, you know, Indian men were real popular with white women. There's all kinds of stories of women running away. You know, the army looking for them and <laughs> saving the woman. And then they wake up the next morning, the woman's gone because she They're went like, back no, to the I Indians. No, I wanted to go. Yeah, there was a big. Leave me alone. <laughs> The Indian, the living the Indian lifestyle was a lot better than living the white man's lifestyle I can in see those that. days. I can totally see that. It was a lot more free. Yeah. And it was a lot more practical. Um, Europeans kind of had some bad habits at that time, you know, and the Indians didn't have the, those. They had bad habits too, but not quite those same bad habits. Yeah. Um, because, you know, people are just what they are, you know, people aren't both. Anyway, what ended up getting the Indians really were cars. Cars and a railroad. You just, it, once that happened, then all of a sudden... People started putting fences up, and you just couldn't go out and hunt the buffalo like the Lakota did at that point. You're walking through other people's land. Yeah. It just didn't... So they, everybody just got jobs. Yeah. You know? That's how it goes. And everybody married other people, and they just... we A friend of ours is an Indian princess, Tori. Yeah. And she's got blonde hair. Not blonde hair. Rainbow-colored hair and blue <laughs> eyes. Well, it's and, blue now, I think. Yeah. And <laughs> she's, a, she's a... What was she? She's a Macaw. Yeah. She's a Macaw. Her dad is... um. Isn't her dad like He's up in Washington, head of Indian relations yeah. or something like something that? Something like that, yeah. She's one of the, almost kind of like an Eskimo type Indian. They, they hunted whale and stuff up in Washington State. Yeah. As far as I know, they still have rights to do that, don't yep. they? Yeah, they're the if only Americans that, that can hunt whale. Yeah, if you're of that particular tribe, that's right. what she told us anyway. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so when the Spaniards first got to Arizona in 15, around 1540, all the area around the Superstition Mountains, that was... Um, you know, occupied, occupied by the Apache. Now, the Superstition Mountains were considered kind of a sacred area. Um, some sources I read said that because they thought it was like the source of the, th you know, where their thunder god lived. Some of them said it was like kind of a hole to hell or whatever, that type of thing, like the underworld or whatever. But in any case, the Spaniards found out that the Apache said that there was gold in there. But see... The Apache, the gold that was ostensibly in the Superstition Mountains, was put there for them, like for their use. So other people were not supposed to go in there and get it. And really, they had a belief. I was like watching that on that uh, In Search Of show. <clears throat> they had a guy, and I think the show was came out in maybe the early 80s, late 70s, early 80s. And they had one guy on there who was like a spokesman for like the what was left of the Apache tribe there. And he was talking about, you know, white man is not supposed to go into the superstition mounds. You're supposed to do all this like rigmarole to go in there. He's like, you know, this entrance is guarded by a male snake and this, 
other entrance is guarded by a female snake and then there's like an abalone <coughs> shell and you have to put like a particular stone in there so the snakes don't get you and all this other kind of stuff so they had like all of these like myths surrounding these mountains that you know that it was kind of just their thing and you weren't supposed to go in there that's why you know the fact that they had these stories about it that's why later on when like they started finding all these skeletons and like people started disappearing in there and shit um they suspected that some of the people had been killed by apache because yeah. apache didn't want them in there understandably because that was like their turf you know so all right so again but when the spaniards get there it seems like every time they heard somewhere had gold in it they were all over that shit so this first uh contingent comes led by francisco vasquez de coronado and they thought since the Apache said something about there being gold in the Superstition Mountains, they said, oh, that must be one of the sites of one of the seven golden, golden cities of Cibola. One of their, you know, it's kind of like El Dorado or kind of, because you know how like the Spaniards, they had all these myths about like cities made out of gold and shit like that. They had a bunch of different names for it. So they thought that maybe that's what this, so that's what that was. So they said, well, we need to go in there and like find that shit. Now, the Apache told them, uh, they're like, no, nah, no, bro, we're not going to help you. That's like, that's where the Thunder God lives. He's going to fuck you up if you go in there. Oops, the cat ran into the camera yeah. again. <laughs> it's like, you know, if you go in there, like, there will be horrible suffering. There will be, like, all these horrible deaths. Like, um, they called the mountains the Devil's Playground. So, of course, the Spaniards did not listen to this. They're just like, the hell with your legends. We just want some gold, so we're going to go in there anyway. So they start, like, poking around in there, and then um, dudes started disappearing, yeah. <laughs> just like the Apaches said would happen. Well, they were probably up in there. Yes. Yeah, so the, the Apaches were master of the ambush. That's what I mean. So I yeah. feel like... Like I said, I think a lot of the legends around the curse, like surrounding this mountain and stuff like that, might have just been like Apache been like, "All right, all right we're just gonna fuck up people that come in here because they're not listening to us about staying out of here." All right. So we're just gonna go in there and kill them. Well, if I remember correctly, the the the, the Apaches one of their one of their main things was was ambushing tr supply lines and roads. That's how yeah. they made a living. They were kind of like. They were kind of like the Hell's Angels of Indians or the Pirates of Indians. You know what I mean? And uh, so they they stole. They stole yeah. from people that came into their territory. Their territory was like a trap. That's how they got so famous for being fierce. Yeah. They killed a lot of people. Yeah. They killed a lot of people. And they enslaved a lot of people and enslaved a lot of Indians and killed a lot of other Indians. They were at war with a bunch of other Indians that were around them. You know, nobody liked them. <laughs> they were kind of like the Klingons. Of the Indians, you know what I'm talking about? I love it. But they were, they the were, Klingons yeah, they were like the, the Klingons, Americans. yeah. <laughs> they were respected, though. You know what I mean? They're, they could fight. They yeah. they were willing to fight. They and they were, you know, nomadic kind of. Well, within that area, you know. Yeah. Yeah, they're badasses. But yeah, so I I feel like so like I said, a lot of the Spaniards go in there. They either wouldn't come out, or they would find them later, yeah. like with their heads cut off and yeah. shit like that. So, of course, the Spaniards, like, thinking, oh, shit, the curse is true. So, finally, after that happened enough times, they're like, all right, just never mind. And then they just left. Um, however, they were the ones, apparently, the Spaniards were the ones that named it Superstition Mountain. Yeah. For that very reason, because of all the stories surrounding it. Now, there's nothing really, like, to report for the next, like, 150 years or so. But then this, there's this Jesuit priest... His name is Eusebio Francisco Kino. And he was coming to um, do like they did, like build a mission and like bring Jesus to the savages and all that whatnot. Yeah. Um, but he also heard tales about gold in the Superstition Mountains and thought that maybe he should like look into that. So um, in about 1710, right, right around there, he started looking around. Now he did find some gold. Although nobody knows if he found it in the Superstition Mountains or just like around there somewhere. You know what I mean? Because there, there's there's a thing about the Lost Dutchman Mine where the guy that kind of gave it its name, who was actually a German, not a Dutch guy, I'll get into that later, but, um, but that he did actually like find gold 
But some people are thinking that maybe he told people it was in the Superstition Mountains just to, like, throw them off. But it was actually, like, somewhere else nearby, like, because he didn't want anybody, like, so there were no stepping witness, on his dick. There were no witnesses to him actually <clears throat> digging that gold out of the ground. Well, none that lived or none that right. said anything. And anyway. we're not talking about coins. These are ingots, right? Or not ingots. Uh, uh, these are uh, just naturally occurring. Yeah, it was, yeah it's, like, it's like, you know, like, pieces of quartz yeah, and stuff with, like, little and veins. Shit like, like, that. And, like, nuggets and stuff. Yeah. All right. So, that, okay. Yeah. <clears throat> you can get those. Yeah. You can get those. You don't have to dig those up, you know. Makes you wonder if that was something he just got his hands on and showed other people. And he said he got it from there. That's. I mean, he did apparently find a lot, but I don't really know. They claim that he found a lot of it. He kept showing up with it. Yeah. Okay. Well, that guy did. But, you know, like I said, they're not entirely sure where he got it. Because some... Some people that are, like, uh, experts in this kind of thing, and, you know, I don't know because I'm not an expert, but they say that the Superstition Mountains are not generally the kind of rock, because I think it's igneous rock, and there's, like, that's not usually the kind of rock where gold veins are found. Mm. Um, there has been gold found in places around there, and there are other, there are gold mines, like, functioning gold mines around there, or there were back then. So mm. it's not like there's no gold in the air at all. Yeah. They're just talking about the Superstition Mountains in particular is probably not a good place to look if you're looking for, like, you know, gold ore, like a vein of gold ore, because it's not usually the kind of rocks that that, that, that would appear in. Okay, but he shows up with gold, and he says he got it out of there. Yeah, Evidently. I mean, yeah. Now, this, like I said, this first guy, he starts showing up. Um, you know, they, they don't know if this is where this, this gold came from, but he did start showing up with, you know, a, a significant amount of gold enough that people noticed, pretty much. Um, so that kind of, like, added more fuel to the fire of like the legends and shit like that but again the more people you know the more he came back and said you know yeah that he had found gold there like people started noticing that he found gold there um the apache started getting more and more pissed off about it so they just decided okay fuck it we're just killing everybody that comes in here or attacking them you know what i mean and just trying to scare everybody away <clears throat> so Many, so several years later, in seventeen, what? Okay, what, now, hold on. That, now, what year was? What year is this going? That on? was that priest came in about seventeen ten. Okay, so this is a long time ago. Uh huh. Okay, so this is before the. Uh, th this is before the war between the United States and the Apache. Yeah. This is a long time. So they're not pacified yet. Right. Quote unquote pacified. All right. I didn't know that the Apache existed that far back. Mm hmm. I thought that they were an 1800s Indian tribe, an 1800s only, but maybe, yeah, maybe so. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because a lot of them didn't last, they were, a, lot, a lot of tribes only lasted a few generations. Three, four generations, they break apart, you know, become other tribes or, you know, get swallowed, or they get small and another tribe kind of swallow them up, you know, marry them. Yeah. You know? So, all right, well, I guess so. I, had, I, haven't, I haven't read a really good modern book about the Indians in a long time. Yeah. All these old tribes. I, I need to get back into that. See see if they found out more information about them. It is really interesting, all that yeah. history about like the really early, like pre-European settlement yeah. history. Well, I know the Lakota were the biggest ones, and that was a huge tribe made up of a bunch of different little sub-tribes. Yeah. And a lot of people, you know, like, the, the, if I remember correctly, the Sioux was a French term for one of the Lakota tribes. Yeah. I, I think the Crow might have been... the part of the Lakota tribes. I, it, they were loosely organized bands, but they did know what groups they belonged to. Yeah. I need to find that. I need, I need to read more about that. It's been a long time. I think that was similar to what happened like here in Florida. Like everybody's, you know, like we had the Seminole and stuff, yeah. but I think the Seminole were kind of like... They were like white were, people. <laughs> well, and they were from other tribes too. It wasn't yeah. like, they weren't like, oh, this tribe and was whatever. They were I, just kind of like... I read I read what Jackson Jackson's problem with them. First of all, they were mercenaries working for the, for the Spanish. Some of them were Native Americans, but a lot of them were Irish. And they had a lot of black people that were also Seminole, and they were all kind of mixing together. And... Some of the some of them were putting on what you call white men's clothing, jumping the border and going back into the United States, conducting business and then without paying any taxes and then going back. And that was part of the thing that was pissing, pissing um, uh, Jackson off is that it was he saw it as a way of dodging taxes. He said if you go in there and look at a lot of these people, he goes they're not Indians, they're white people. 
They need to be paying taxes. <laughs> <laughs> so he gave them all ultimatum. They either become citizens or they go out to, to uh, Indian territory. And the the Seminole became Americans. Yeah. They didn't they didn't go after the Indian zone. So you know, that's just how it went. That's how history <laughs> was. Because you could play Indian. You know what yeah. I mean? That's a good lifestyle. Yeah. And then then you could go you could you could go into town too, and that was a good lifestyle. So it was it was a way of I guess getting yeah, over the best of both worlds. Yeah, the worlds. best of both worlds. You're claiming <laughs> to be in an Indian tribe and one of the five civilized tribes and having all the benefits of that. But you're also white enough and Western enough to damn go into town, conduct business, drink in a saloon, and you know do whatever and you no want. No one will say anything. Nobody will say anything about it, and and you know you don't have to pay any taxes. And evidently that that caused a big problem. Win win. So Jackson, the whole thing with Jackson was about he he said it was it was dodging taxes, which it may have been. Maybe it was maybe it was relevant for a few generations, but it had gotten to the point to where it, it didn't make any sense anymore. That's what, that's what, that's, that's what they said. Yeah. You know, that's maybe true. it made sense a hundred years before that or 80 years before that, but everyone had become integrated and it didn't make any sense anymore. Yeah. Well, the law is yeah. always like slower to catch up. It's always slower to catch up what the situation was. You know, what are you going to yeah. do? Yeah. But they're still here kind of. Got all the names of the Seminole. Well, they, actually they've been flooded by everybody else from New York coming here. Although Florida is full of Indian place names, we yeah, have all yeah. kind of Indian place names down here. Mm -hmm. In case you guys, our mall's know. named after them. This will, Seminole we, Square. Li we live in Seminole <laughs> County. This is where the Seminole were. This is yeah, we, yeah. We live in Seminole, and County. they were actually fighting on the side of the Spaniards for a long time. Yeah, but then like the war against them lasted like one day. I don't even think anybody was killed, and then they decided, no, we'll flip sides. Just, <laughs> Fuck this! Yeah, we we'll flip sides, and, about and right. then, they, then they became a, they, they 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 start they supported the United States after that. <laughs> well, Spain Spain couldn't offer them anything at that time. The money had, the money in Spain had dried up. Yeah, yeah. Spain <laughs> couldn't Spain couldn't hold on to Florida anymore. Yeah, we were too. Yeah, about... This is Spanish territory, really. Yeah. Or it was at one time, and a lot of it still looks like Spain. Even well, the, yeah. Even the new buildings they build here, like all these little houses, they look like little Spanish houses. Spanish, well, like I said, Spanish if, castles. If you go to St. Augustine, which is not only a few miles from here, and it is the oldest permanent settlement in the United States. Yeah. That is a Spanish fort and a Spanish village. Yeah. So, the fort there is called Castillo de San Marcos. Yeah. It's pretty cool, actually. I imagine there are all kinds of Europeans that want to come. They, here and they shoot the cannons and everything. Imagine all kinds of Europeans that come would, would like to come down here and trip out on all this Indian stuff and old-fashioned American shit, old west stuff. Old-fashioned American. Yeah. <laughs> we don't have like yeah we don't have all we like take all it for granted. We don't have all the colonial shit like they mm. have up, like up in New England and stuff. But no. we do have like a lot of old Spanish. Shit. Yeah, we got the Spanish stuff. Yeah. All right, so, like I said, um, so the Jesuit priest came and, like, you know, he apparently found some gold, either in the superstitions or somewhere around there. So, you know, rumors started to get, more rumors started to get around. People were like, oh, there's gold in there. And then the Apache were like, man, fuck, now we're just going to have to kill everybody that comes in there. Now, in 1748, the superstitions, as they're called, um, and there was also about almost 4,000 square miles of land surrounding that in Arizona, uh, although it wasn't Arizona then, obviously. Yeah, it was just, a, uh, it was Mexico probably at that yeah. time. Yeah. Um, we're actually given to uh, a Mexican cattle baron by the name of Don Miguel Peralta. Yeah. Now yeah. this was supposedly a land grant. Now I have seen some sources, the The main source that I'm using for this, this, like the chronology and the notes and everything are from like a site about like American legends and like American history and stuff. Um, I have seen some sources that say that there is some question about, not that the, I mean, the Peraltas did exist, but, you know, whether they actually did own this land at any point, whether the land grant was a forgery, whether there's like all kind of different things going on. But the story goes that the Peralta family got the, got the Superstition Mountains along with a bunch of other land in a land grant in 1748. Now, the land, not necessarily the superstitions, but the land around that that they had actually did have a gold mine and a silver mine. So they did find gold and silver on this particular land. I think there was actually more than one silver mine on there. 
So this is kind of like the first inkling that there's like a, an actual gold mine and a silver mine in this, in this location. So evidently the Peralta family lived there, um, you know, for the next hundred years, something like that. Like the, you know, descendants of the family like lived there and they had the mines there and worked on them and uh, brought out all kind of gold and silver. Now they tried to like not piss off the Apache, um, you know, to varying degrees of success. So they tried to like not take out too much or like try to keep it on the DL, you know what I mean? So like the Apache wouldn't get pissed off at them. And it seemed to have worked for a while, but then in 1846, um, there were four, I don't know, there, I guess there were sons, grandsons, however long the, the period was, uh, of the Peralta family, whose names were Enrico, Pedro, Ramon, and Manuel. They decided, well, we're going to go into Arizona and go into the superstitions and look for some more gold there. Now, they apparently went there. I don't know if they went to the superstitions or not, but they went to somewhere around there and they came back with a whole shit ton of gold. So, you know, th then they were like, okay, well, we need to like, we came back okay. We got all this gold. We're going to go again next year and get some more gold. So they decided to go back again. However, at this point, the Mexican War was, you know, kind of raging full on. Um, Mexican-American War. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, um, Pedro decided he was the only one that said he was going to go back because the, the other three were just like, no, it's too, too dangerous. So Pedro said, okay, well, I'm going to go back there to Arizona. I'm going to get as much gold as I can possibly get before, um, you know, the outcome of the war and like this, cause this land might go back to Mexico and then, or might go to the United States and then we won't have rights over it anymore or something like that. So they wanted to go extract as much as they could extract. Now, he decides to go back, um, and the Apache are pissed off about it. So apparently there was, like, kind of a conflict, and then when the Peraltas left, when Pedro left and everything like that, they said, okay, well, we're going to take all the gold we can take, and then we are going to hide the entrance of the mine and just cover it up, and we're just not going to tell anybody where it is. And we're just going to take all the gold we took and get the fuck out of here. Like before yeah. we get our asses killed. And that's legend goes that that's what they did. So that's why people are saying this like, Oh, nobody knows where the mine is and stuff. Cause they said, Oh, well the Peraltas had the mine because they found like all this gold up evidently, but they sealed it up and wouldn't tell anybody where it was just, you know, yeah. cause they had all the gold they needed. And it's like, they didn't want anybody else to find it. They're like, well, maybe we'll be able to go back later and get it or some shit like that. You know, um, Jair, mm -hmm. he's a subscriber. He's from he's from uh, Mexico. He's a buddy of mine. He's over in uh, TJ. He's up in Tijuana. We were online discussing the Mexican-American War. I was always under the impression that we just kind of took the Southwest. That's kind of how it's portrayed, but not really. It was uh, technically we bought it. We were in a, got in a conflict over Texas. Santa Ana was in charge of Mexico yeah. at that time. And he was kind of a dictator, all right? And there was kind of a, a rebellion against Santa Ana fomenting against him, and he really couldn't fight two wars at once. And um, Texas was kind of disputed. A bunch of Americans were moving in there like illegal aliens in a way. And they, weren't, they didn't want to obey Mexican law. And it was pretty complicated how it went. But... Um, Mexico broke off relations with us over that. And a war broke out. Uh, and uh, so I don't think very many Mexicans were killed in that first battle. I think it was like 200. It might have, I don't know. I don't remember exactly what the numbers were. But anyway, um, Santa Ana basically gave up. He sued for peace. He says, okay, if you want it, you can have it. You just got to pay me $15 million for it. So we gave him the $15 million. So really it was purchased. Yeah, a lot. See, a lot of it had to do with that Louisiana Purchase. Yeah. Okay. Well, that Louisiana Purchase was kind of disputed by Spain and Mexico, certain zones and areas of it. But definitely, we didn't have California and Nevada and New Mexico, and we didn't really have Texas. But that all got settled during that war with Santa Ana. Santa Ana said we could have it all for third for 
I think it was 13 million. So we just said, yeah. <laughs> yeah, right, okay. We'll take and, 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 it. So we just bought it. Yeah, <laughs> bought it from them. I thought we just took it, but no, we bought it. And then there was that Treaty of Guadalupe, you know, which, which designated the modern border between the United States and Mexico. That was that was part of what we bought. Yeah. That that's where it begins and that's where it ends. Because Mexico really had inherited the claim to that land through Spain. That's what Spain claimed. Yeah. But the Mexican Revolution threw Spain out. So technically, that wasn't Mexico's claim. It was Spain's claim. And all these claims were European claims anyway. And there weren't enough troops to enforce anything. And, and everybody's map looked differently. The only way you were going to decide who owned that land was to fight for it or to buy it and make an agreement. Yeah. So that's just what That's it what went. I mean. It was like, what just, else could you do back then? I'm yeah. sure everything was like a giant cluster. Everybody claimed everything. Right. So it's it, like, well, we said the French have this map, yeah. the Spanish have this map, the English have this right. map. We yeah. own all this shit. They're like, no, we own that. Yeah. Every <laughs> European superpower, had, and it, it, probably China had a claim on it too, going back to when they first came here fucking 2,000 years ago. You know? <laughs> but because uh, they sent a damn navy over here too, I think in the, the 50, in the 1500s. And there was evidently a navy right out of California. Uh, I, I think they, there's evidence that there's Chin ancient Chinese anchors out there. Off the coast of California. I've they heard think that. I'm here. not. Yeah, I'm not sure. I I read a book about that a long time ago. I think it was called 1491 yeah. or something like that. Or maybe I'm thinking of a different thing. But I think I read a book about it. But I don't There's know. A good chance. Yeah, I don't know if that's been definitively proved. But you know, anything can happen. Like I said, right. shit. I was reading something the other day. That said, you know, there's a slim possibility that the ancient fucking Phoenicians yeah. discovered America. <laughs> well, this whole this whole this whole Kukul Khan thing, you know, uh, um, he's described as a white man with blue eyes and a beard that taught them everything that they knew, and they're talking about two thousand years ago. Yeah. So how the hell did he get here? Right. That was in Mexico. You know. Well, it's, maybe somebody went through the Straits of Gibraltar and a storm got him and he washed up there. You know, might have been some kind of an ancient Greek trading vessel. That's what I mean, because that had I mean, somebody on there, you know, that knew how to work with stone. Because, I mean, they know it. for sure that the Phoenicians were like the powerhouse, like sailors of yeah. ancient times. Right. And they know that they went past the Straits of Gibraltar. They know they right. went like really far. They might have circumnavigated Africa. Um, you know, they think they got to the Indian Ocean. So it's like they got pretty far. So it's not that crazy to think that maybe, I mean, maybe they didn't do it on purpose, but it's not that crazy to think that they maybe kind of stumbled across. There's a bunch of weird shit. How the hell did black people get on Easter Island off the coast of Chile? They were there a long, long time ago. You know, did they come out of Australia? You know? That's what I mean. It's like, that's a long way away. It is. But, you yeah. know. I guess anything can happen given enough time. Yeah. that's. I think people forget. It's like thousands yeah. and thousands of years. And it's like, plus, right. they had boats and shit. And it's like. Yeah. There may have been civilizations coming It only had to happen once or twice. <laughs> and a civilization might come and go and we have no record of it. Might have been too far back. I know. Isn't that freaky to think yeah. about? Right. That's one reason I think. So I wish somebody would, like, invent a time machine. Just, a, mm. just so you could, like, go back and see what the fuck happened. Because I'm just fascinated yeah. by that kind of mysteries. And, like, the longer ago it is, it's, like, the less likely the less that you're you know ever going to know. Right. And that, like, that really annoys me because I really want to know. You know what I mean? Well, there wasn't... We know that there wasn't anybody in the Americas until after that damn short-faced bear went extinct after the Ice Age. Yeah. You just... Humans couldn't live alongside the short-faced bear. Because that short-faced bear was a dick. Yeah. So... And, you know... When you talk about Indians, you're not talking about one people. There's a lot of different kinds yeah. of them. And they were coming from probably all the other continents. So, you know, because shit, up in the Northeast, the first, uh, uh, you know, the first colonies that showed up reported back that, oh, the Indians looked like us. You know? <laughs> and if you go down to the, if you go down into the, into the, into the Southwest, the Indians looked kind of Mexican. Because, of course, you know, that's where it, it's in that area. Yeah. So, you know, you're not talking about one race of people. So I think the American continent had been invaded over and over and over again 
over the past fucking 50,000 years. Kind of hard to miss. It's kind of big. Yeah. So I think over the past 25,000, probably 25,000 years. I think. So it's like my, I said, all it would take was like a couple of boats to get blown yeah. off course. And they're like, oh, where the fuck are we? Yeah. And it probably. <laughs> oh, well, I guess we're stuck here now. And I guess you could probably walk into northern, northeastern Canada. For a time, you for could. For a sure. time. All Actually, for quite a long time, you could. So that might explain why the people in New Eng- in the Indians in the New England area back in the 1400s were reported as, well, they look kind of like white people. They look just like us. Yeah. That's my only explanation. <laughs> they might have been partly European. Like I said, I think there was a lot more traveling going on back yeah. then than people like realize. Yeah. But as I said, I'm get- for a long time, people didn't think what, you know... I remember back when I was a kid and people would say stuff like, oh, Vikings, like, discovered America. And people were like, oh, that sounds like bullshit. But no, it's no, true. No, they were there. Yeah, I mean, they yeah. didn't, like, colonize to any great extent. They only had, like, a few settlements and stuff. But they know for sure that they were there now. They were here before Columbus. They were, Yeah, way before. Like, yeah. up in, uh, you know, up in Newfoundland. Newfoundland, yeah. And shit like that. So, who knows what they'll discover in the future. I don't think those colonies stuck, though. No, they didn't. They, they died were, out. They actually weren't there for very long. Yeah. Well, they were there they for... They went back. Yeah, they were there for a time, and then they went back. Yeah. Because it just... I guess it wasn't really worth it right. to them. It was only, like, a few major settlements. Okay, so, let's see. So, one of the Peraltas, I think, like, Pedro, like I said, he's like, okay, we're going to get all the gold we can get the and seal up the mine, and we'll get the fuck out of here. Now, this was over the winter of uh, 1847, 1848. So, they load up all the burrows with gold, like him and all his crew and everything like that, and they're getting the fuck out of there, and then they get attacked by the Apaches. Now, the pack mules apparently, like, kind of ran off and, like, all the gold went all over the place. Um, So, for a while, the story goes that there was just gold scattered everywhere until, like, all the prospectors came and, like, picked it off and shit. Um, And also, there's a story that in the 1850s, two prospectors had gone in there looking for, you know, looking for a vein of gold, and they found three dead burrows with pack saddles that had $37,000 worth of gold in it. So this was supposedly Hmm. when they were leaving and they all got killed by Apaches. So let's um, stop for a moment because we're almost at an hour. So let's stop for a moment to take a break because it looks like you probably need to refresh your drink. I'm all right with mine right now. Ice uh, falling out. Your ice is falling out. Pookie's being good. She's sleeping behind the laptop. She's only moved the camera this one time, so we're, we're hoping that she's sleepy enough to not start running around and fucking with all the equipment but so we're gonna take a break right now we will be back in just a few minutes where'd you go where'd you go oh it's your chicken stick get it you're just gonna push it right off of there aren't you well now look what happened you want me to get it for you want me to get it don't you go over there and chew on that shit here here nope hey 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 Yeah. Oh, it's good, right? It's good. Yummy. Yummy. Oh, you suck. (laughs) Oh, dear. This is my life. No! You love true crime. I love true crime. And I've spent the last three years compiling a series of the most intriguing unsolved murders of the 20th century. It's called The Faceless Villain, and Volume 3 is available now. Featuring such fascinating cases as the Caddy Murders, the Carrie Babies Case, the Frog Boys, the Alcacer Murders, and the Anokashira Park Dismemberment Incident, The Faceless Villain Volume 3 is an involving exploration of unsolved slang spanning the years from 1980 to 1999. Pick up your copy in print or ebook formats on Amazon, or download the audiobook version from audible.com, and get ready for a chilling journey through modern crime history. All right, so we're back from the break. Now, before we went, I was talking about poor old Pedro Peralta and his coming out of the th- coming out of the fucking canyons of the Superstition Mountains and getting ambushed by Apache, mm. and they all got killed and all their gold got scattered and everything like that. So now, after that happened, the Peralta, the rest of the Peralta family who still owned mines in the area, were understandably um, a little gun shy. Uh, going back into the area to mine any more gold. So it was about 16 years before anyone else, like, decided to venture back out there. But finally, Enrico Peralta took 400 guys out into the superstitions to look for gold, look for the mine, look for whatever. However, 
just as in the case of poor Pedro. He gets to the northwest slope of the mountain, him and his 400 dudes, and they are ambushed by Apaches who kill all but one of the party. That way he could take a message back. That's probably why they left him alive. Just like I tell just like the Klingons. Yeah, it's like, like the Go Klingons. back and warn the others. Like, tell them. <laughs> tell them what happened. Stay the fuck out of here. Yeah. And apparently that area of the mountains is still to this day known as Massacre Ground. Mm-hmm. See, there's the title of your horror movie right yeah, there. there Get is. on that Massacre screenwriters. Ground. We'll say, you know, this would be really good, I think. I'll make a hell of an action scene with all those fucking Apaches. That's what I mean. And they just Kill, like yeah. fuck everyone up, man. Yeah. Cut all your heads off and all that stuff. Yeah. All right. So mm. the next kind of uh, significant dude in this story. And I, I say that kind of like, because according to the Wikipedia page, and like I said, I read the Wikipedia page and it's, you know, it's not super well written. It's kind of all over the place. But like this one that was on Legends of America or whatever the site is called, it's like way better. It was like a four page like breakdown. Um, now, no one is exactly sure if this Dr. Abraham Thorne person, who was like the next, you know, big deal, like in this myth uh, or in the legend around this mine, was a real dude. Now, a lot of these people were real dudes because they have like, you know, records of them and shit, like the Peralta family and the later, like Jacob Waltz and later, the later guy that it was named after. But this guy, they're not really sure. They don't have like a record of a Dr. Abraham Thorne that, you know, in this area at the time. But that doesn't mean he wasn't a real guy, but it's just, I don't know if there's, if he's a real guy or not. But so the next part of the legend says that Dr. Abraham Thorne uh, in 1865 was working as an army doctor in Arizona at Fort McDowell. Now, by this point, um, you know, relations between the Apache and the U.S. Army were not good. So, you know, they were kind of fighting and the uh, Apache were also fighting against all the settlers coming into Arizona. Now, there was a, a reservation established and Dr. Abraham Thorne was apparently working on this reservation and he treated some Apache for some, like, di- for some disease that they had. And the story goes that the Apache showed their appreciation to Dr. Thorne by telling him that they would show him where there was some gold in the superstitions, but the caveat being that he couldn't know exactly where they were. So they took his ass there blindfolded. So the story goes. Yeah, that sounds like a story. Yeah. So like I said, like a lot of the players in this are like real people because they have yeah. records of them. This guy, not so much. Okay. So I'm not really sure entirely where this story came from, but this is like a big part of the legend. So apparently the, the Apache said, okay, just put the blindfold on and we'll take you out to the superstitions. Uh, it was a 20 mile journey. Now, apparently he says that he gets there, they take the blindfold off and he was near the mine entrance and there was like a pile of gold ore like stacked near the base of the canyon, like the wall of the canyon. So he said that there was like a weird, like a rock pinnacle um, that was off to the south, which some people always assume is Weaver's Needle. That's where all this stuff comes about, you know, the Lost Dutchman's mind being in the shadow of Weaver's Needle because they assumed that's what he was talking about. So the Indians apparently said, you can take as much of that gold ore as you can carry, and then we're going to put the blindfold on you and, you know, and get out of here and don't come back. So apparently Dr. Thorne ended up selling uh, this gold ore that he picked up for about $6,000, which back in the day, that was a lot of money. So apparently, though, what happened was that He kind of went back on his promise, so the story goes, and he told some of his friends, and they actually went and found the mine, and they were like, woohoo, and they like put all the gold and shit in their saddlebags, and then they're like, we, we're we're rich and everything, and while they're going out of the superstitions, he patched, he's like, fuck you guys, and they killed them all. Yeah. So again, that's how that story goes. It sounds like a story. Yeah, see, I'm not sure if that guy is a real guy or not, because that's kind of one where it's not super uh super there's not a lot of provenance for that dude's existence okay now one guy that's probably the most famous guy associated with the lost lost dutchman's mine and the reason why it's called the lost dutchman's mine is this next dude who's named jacob waltz now they called him the dutchman even though he was a german yeah because 
the German word for German is Deutsch. And, uh, yeah, there's a lot of confusion with that in the United States. Yeah, so they kind of called, so if they called somebody a Dutchman, that they usually meant, meant they were a German. Yeah, because they would show up here and, you know, the guys barely spoke English. And they would just hear, well, he's he says, you know, he's, he's saying he's Deutsch. He's Deutsch, yeah. he must be Dutch. Yeah, oh, Dutchman, okay. That's what they're thinking, you know. <laughs> yeah, the American English and the American vernacular was kind of confused a lot about ger- certain Germanic names for things. Yeah. Uh, you know what I mean? There's a lot of confusions in, in our language about who comes from where. Some of them are based on Italian stuff, too. Yeah. Which I can't remember off the hand, but I remember that a lot of those Italian names that are in usage here in the United States are actually totally wrong. Yeah. It's just what the guy wrote down because that's what he understood. Because when I, they were coming I bet in that through Ellis. Yeah, they were coming through Ellis Island and asked the guy's name he said one thing the guy the guy right the american guy tries to write it down he's, and he's like, like eh, yeah, close enough something like that yeah there that's it is. your name now that's Bye. Your name. <laughs> there, yeah. that probably happened all. right <laughs> so yeah jacob waltz who actually did exist because they have many many records of him and like documents with his signature on it and stuff like that um he was a german immigrant and he had moved to arizona at some point this was uh, about in the 1870s now supposedly he was friends with one of the heirs of the Peralta family and they had told him where the mine was roughly. Now he had actually, uh, Waltz actually worked as a prospector. Um, and he actually had a house, uh, near the superstition mountains. So this was, I guess, kind of exciting for him that somebody from the Peralta family told him where this mine was. Now, he had actually worked in a gold mine before in Wickenburg, Arizona. Now, while he was there again, so the story goes, he supposedly met an Apache girl whose name was Ken T. Now, him and her started getting busy, even though he was 60 years old and she was not uh, much. She was she was much younger than that. Did <laughs> I don't, you say? I don't know how much younger, yeah. but it said girl, so I'm assuming that means under 18 maybe maybe so yeah this also might be a story yeah but like i said yeah. this this dude did you know he he was around he has he a was. grave he had all they have all kind of documentation of him although fucking general custer was big into like 13 12 and 13 year old you Indian, could totally get away Indian with Indian girls it yeah was it wasn't even was. seen as unusual yeah it, it, it really wasn't it's just it's a girl very supposed, strange a girl was supposed to be married at around 13 so that's yeah, about. So you could pound out as many kids as possible yeah, before you and, croaked. Yeah, and that's about. You know, we're talking eighteen hundreds, and thirteen is about the age they'd be married. Yeah. But what they're not telling you is the guys marrying them a lot of times are thirty. Yeah. Forty. Because they had enough or money. Or sixty, like in yeah. this case. <laughs> Back then, the priority was how much money did he have. Yeah. Because they also paid, did things like paid dowries. Well, yeah. So, you know. That was kind of like the only consideration. Right. right. How much money, how much stability, and does he move you up in the social standing? Yeah. That's all it was about. Yep. Sad, really. That's why there were so many hookers. Yeah. <laughs> it was like a life of freedom. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I mean. I've totally, yeah. I read a couple of books about, um, and I can't remember the name of it, there was one about like a lot of courtesans, like back in, uh, yeah. you know, back in England and stuff. And uh, reading it, I was kind of like, Yeah, I think I probably would have done that rather than live under the strictures that women were put under. Back in those days. Back in those days, it's like it would have been way more fun. Back in those days, if you were a woman, you you would want to be a Louisiana Octoroon. Or an Octoroon. Uh, They were kind of like the geisha of the United States. You You had to be rich to have an Octoroon mistress. She lived a life of uh, basically what you kind of like a middle class woman of today. She'd have her own apartment. Yeah, she could have her own place. Her own place. She didn't have a dude there like putting stinky socks all over the floor or like leaving pee on the toilet seat or whatever. No, and she wasn't married, but the guy who had the contract with her, it was like a marriage. He chose her out of love. Yeah. And he loved her. Yeah, he he, made an arrangement through the the mother, the octroon balls. All right. They didn't love the wife in, in general. The guy didn't, because he was forced into that marriage. Well, yeah, that was usually, like, set up That was an arranged families. marriage with his family, usually having to do with property and in order to keep control over certain, like, plantations and factories and shit that they had in the South. 
No, they, they the Southern man, the rich Southern man. Southern man. Southern man. He couldn't. <laughs> the rich Sorry, Southern man, when he was 20, 30, trying to get married from a rich family, he couldn't choose his wife. Yeah. The family did. He chose. He could choose his. He could choose his octroon mistress, though. Yeah. So, that they actually kind of dated. At least they had a relationship. And this is, there's p- portraits of them. You can look it up. They were they were gorgeous too. And some of them were women that were Irish girls pre- pretending to be octroon. Yeah. That's another one too. But well, yeah. Why wouldn't you? Right. If you could get away with it. Yeah. I mean, because that was kind of like a little bit of a prize. I hate to use the word commodity, but that's probably yeah. how they looked at it. Well, the one I the one I read was about um, was actually about England, and it was kind of talking about like Cora Pearl and all your like really famous courtesans, yeah. and they were saying that like particularly under the strictures of like Victorian England, it's like these women, like I said, they had these massive, they had tons of money, they had these massive apartments, they had these huge parties with like all yeah. these like like famous like artists and intellectuals yeah. and stuff would come to their parties and it was like super super like hip like to go yeah. to their parties and like even though they were hookers quote unquote yeah. it's like no one really looked down on them because they were kind of like they were superstars yeah they were like the superstars of yeah. their day yeah you had to like you know sleep with gross ass men but you know what i mean it's like they had money though that was like a probably a small yeah. price to pay in yeah. that particular in environment that time. And another thing I want to mention is that the word star that you know today, like, oh, that person's a star, that came from that. Mm-hmm. Uh, in in west in Western brothels in the United States, women didn't like to be just hookers. That's not really a cool thing, you know what I mean? They wanted to have skills outside of that. So they learned how to sing and dance. And at those hotels, they had, um, what do you call them, theaters. And they would sing and dance and put on shows. Well, they would take that girl's, they would take a photo of that girl or that girl's name and put it inside of a star. Yeah. Outside the theater. All right. So that girl's name was in these stars. They usually had more than one star to put on a whole show. All right. That way, this woman could now have a little more self esteem for herself. She was an actress and an entertainer. Her name was in a star. That's it, literally. And she could ask for more money. Yeah. She, you know, and that's where the word star came from. It's just, like I said, it really, and reading that book particularly about, um, you know, the courtesans in England and stuff, it really gave you a new appreciation for, you know, women at the time, you know, they didn't have a lot of, like, choices and what they could do and stuff like that. But these women were, like, entrepreneurs, really, yeah. because they were, op- they opened their, a lot of them went on to open their own brothels where they didn't even have to do the dirty work anymore they hired other women to do it for them here's something else for you guys if anybody's a fan of western movies and old west stuff and gunfighters and shit like if you look back into history guys like doc holiday and 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 the other you know wild bill hickok they dated these stars yeah that's who their girlfriends were all right some of these gunfights all right would go down in these towns over those women yeah that's some weird shit when you think about it. <laughs> you know, he, he's dating a star. She's also working. Yeah. And he gets jealous of the Johns, and then they have a hang, <laughs> they have a shootout over this prostitute. But he loves her. Yeah. You know, that, a lot of that was going on. I believe people it. are people. Yeah, it's just people like I people. said, in all times and all places. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing changes really. Yeah, and at certain times, certain places, these trick shots and gunfighters and you know uh guys like you know fucking what's his name john wesley harden you know people know you know he's the meanest motherfucker in the world shot a guy because he was snoring it's actually kind of bullshit do it do when he got he killed a lot of dudes but it was in self-defense when he got out he became a lawyer he was only dead about a year in jail uh became a lawyer and um they did the same kind of stuff you know what i mean uh if a woman wasn't married then there must have been something wrong with her you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, so, if you were a single guy, there was really no such thing as dating. Chances were it was going to be, you were going to be hanging out with a star. Yeah. That's the, you know Well, I mean? it's not like you had a lot of options. There was no options for I the mean, men. Yeah, it's not like nowadays where you just like date people and it's normal. Yeah, it's like, you didn't know, have that. No, because yeah. like, like you said, all the married ones, they, they, married. they usually arranged them and like right. you couldn't They get were either those. married or they were old ladies. Yeah. You know, the only available young women were stars. Yeah. Maybe Indian women. Yeah. 
you know. So you you know, About human it. nature being what it is, that's right. how shit's gonna go down. Yeah. Because you know, life finds a way. As Jeff Goldblum said. Right. <laughs> Evidently, the whole Mandan <laughs> tribe went extinct because everybody married their women. Yeah. That's how the story goes. I don't know if it's true. Evidently, I've heard that story, yeah. Evidently, they were that the they most, had, like, the most beautiful they women. They had the most beautiful Indian women. They were up near the Northeast somewhere. And evidently, every one of them got married off to a white guy who <laughs> gave a huge dowry. And it doesn't take Meanwhile, long. the dudes in the tribe were like, what the fuck? Well, Girls. Well, they were, might have been going out with, you know, other Indian women. Yeah. So, but it doesn't take long to upset the balance of a reproductive system. You know what I mean? All you have to do is take a couple of generations away, and that's it. Yeah. You know? True. And these, the, maybe that tribe wasn't that big to begin with. But they, really, they had whole songs about Mandan Indian women. Mandan women. <laughs> Give me Mandan woman and all that kind of stuff. And it sounded like that. They were really the best looking ones. <laughs> or at least somebody thought that. <laughs> at least the person that wrote the song did. <laughs> it's a legend. It's, a, it's legendary stories yeah. of the West. Yeah. So, uh, again, going back to another legendary story of the West. So, as I said, Jacob Waltz, he apparently marries... Well, I don't know if he married her, but, like, you know, they were together. Um, this much younger uh, Apache girl named Ken T. Now, shortly after this happened, Waltz got fired from his job at the uh, Vulture Gold Mine in Wickenburg, Arizona, because he was doing what they call high-grading the ore, meaning when he found the ore, he would just pocket the good shit, and then just be like, hey, I just found yeah, this yeah. kind of low suit. So he was stealing, essentially. Yeah. So, uh, you know, they let him go. And then uh, him and Ken T moved to the Superstition Mountains. Now... There are two versions of the story. One version says that he found out where the mine was from a member of the Peralta family that he knew. Another version of the story says that Ken T, who was Apache, that she told him. So I don't know. But he supposedly found out uh, in one way or another. Now, in the version of the story where Ken T told him, uh, when they actually went there looking for it, the Apache saw her and took her, like kidnapped her and cut her tongue out Damn. like in retaliation because mm. she wasn't supposed to tell anybody where it was. Sounds like a story. So I don't, like I said, I don't know. Sounds like a story. I don't know. Because if she already told, then what, what good would it be to cut the tongue out? I guess they were just punishing her. Yeah. Just like, this got you in trouble, so we're yeah. just getting rid of this. You can't get any more trouble. But uh, supposedly after that happened, um, Waltz got away and he went and uh, opened a saloon. Apparently not too worse for wear. Now, in 1877, he meets this other guy, again, who may or may not be fictional. I'm not real sure. He's either called Jacob Weiser or Jacob Wisner. I've seen it spelled both ways. So then they go into the superstitions looking for this mine. Now, not too long after they went in there, they started to come out and they and people started to notice that they were coming into Phoenix, like paying for things with gold ore. And it was real good shit, too. So they never like filed a claim for a mine or anything like that. So like, you know, as shit does back then. When you come into a store and you're, like, paying for stuff with, like, really good shit, people are like, hmm, I wonder where he got that from. So, like, stories start going around. Now, a couple of years after that, apparently, um, Waltz's partner, his partner, who I don't know if he exists or not, he apparently disappeared without a trace. Now, hmm. some people said that Waltz killed him. Some people said the Apaches killed him. So, whether he existed or not, I don't know. If he did, he disappeared and somebody killed him, they think. So, could have been either one of them. Although, somebody could disappear for many different reasons back then. True that. Yeah. So, it could have just not been anything nefarious whatsoever. Right. Although, considering all the sketchy shit that went down around these gold mines, I would right. imagine it was probably nefarious. <laughs> these bitches killed each other over, like... Well, they did it because you could. Yeah, it's I mean, like you, you could, could get away with it back then. Yeah. If you found a fucking gold thing and like people were trying to like infringe on your shit, man, they would just like blow your head off. They didn't care. Yeah, I would. I would assume back in those days, there were dudes that had kill kills that were you know rival the the numbers of kills of like serial killers. Oh, I'm sure. Today. I'm sure that it, you know that it was 
that there were guys out there that killed over 100 people. Oh, the uh, there must have been. There must have been. It probably wasn't a big deal. Because, yeah, like I said, we, they, they didn't look at it the same way. No. Because yeah. there was so much. I mean, it was a lot of places were still kind of lawless. Yeah. It's like there was this That's whole thing. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, like I said, there was this whole thing about, like, gold mines. It's like, you know, if you didn't yeah. stake your claim on it, you had to, like, protect it. And if, like, people came and tried to steal your shit, then you had to, like. Well, there's probably a lot of guys that would kind of befriend somebody else and over time to say you didn't like him. And they're out there in the field together and just kills that dude in his sleep. Or takes pushes all, him off a cliff. Yeah, or and takes all his shit. Yeah. You know what I mean? And then moves like, on yeah, like I'm it doesn't even dude. happen. You're right, yeah. Moves on like nothing even happens. And then yeah, fucking vultures will eat you. Pawns off his stuff, you know? Make a living doing that. You know, there's guys in India, you know, with the, the Thugi. Yeah. Where they kind of basically did that. Well, like I Make said. Make a living stealing and killing. I mean, particularly back in the Old West, it's not like. Yeah. It's not like you were really going to get. I mean, you know. You could get away with a lot back then. <laughs> you didn't have to worry about DNA back then. Yeah, exactly. They, or police response time. They didn't even have like like fingerprinting or anything, no. really. No police response time or anything. As no. long as you didn't, were no witnesses, you'd, you'd never get caught. Yeah. Nobody said, and even if there were. Yeah. You could just kill the witnesses. <laughs> that too. <laughs> it's like, well, what's one yeah. more? Yeah. <laughs> so after that, after his, uh, you know, possibly fictional partner disappeared... So, over the next decade, Jacob Walt starts turning up in Phoenix, like, buying supplies and things like that, and he would have, like, saddlebags full of, like, really good gold ore. And then he would, you know, get his stuff, and then he would take off back into the Superstition Mountains again. So, people were like, where the fuck is he getting all this gold from? There must be, like, this really kick-ass, like, mine in the Superstition Mountains somewhere. So, they start asking him about it, and, like, a smart person... He tells everybody different shit. Or mm-hmm. he tells them, like, contradictions. He's not going to tell... Why the fuck would you tell anybody where it is? They're just right. going to kill you and, like, take your fucking... You know what I mean? So, you know, and sometimes he'd be like, oh, yeah, come on, I'll show you. And then, like, they'd follow him and then, like, he would give them the slip. And they would yeah. be like, oh, what the fuck? <laughs> so, like I said, he was obviously not a dummy. Now, in 1891, apparently, uh, Waltz's house, which was right near the Superstition Mountains... Uh, was actually destroyed in a flood. Now, he was saved by two brothers, uh, whose names were Herman and Reinhardt Petrash. And uh, he also was um, taken care of by a woman named Julia Thomas, who I guess was a nurse. And uh, But he had, you know, during the flood and the storm and everything like that, he had gotten pneumonia. And he thought that he was probably going to die. So he sent friends back to his house which was now just kind of like rubble because the flood and everything he said i had some gold like kind of stashed under the floorboards or whatever so go see if you can find that so his friends go there and the house was gone uh the flood had swept it away but they did find five sacks with gold in it and this was worth about fifteen thousand dollars i'm guessing Hmm. in back then money which was like a huge huge amount so they brought it back to him because he's like the honest, the most honest dudes in the old west. <laughs> yeah, it almost sounds suspicious. I know. So they yeah. like, so they bring him. He's like, "Here's your stuff, man," and uh, they put it under his sick bed. Now, apparently, while he was in this final illness, and while this uh, Julia Thomas woman was around, he supposedly would like go in and out of like he'd be feverish and stuff, and he would like supposedly give clues to where this mine was. Um, but Why, you know, they were asking him, I guess they probably <laughs> were. They're like, he's yeah. going to die soon. Get yeah, that. Him, him. Uh, come on. Like, tell him, maybe he'll say, write it down, write it down. That might mean something. So, <laughs> so apparently he's given him clues the whole time, even though, like I said, if he was like, so appreciative and he thought he was going to die and stuff, you'd think he would just tell him outright, yeah, like where exactly it was instead of being all fucking cagey about it. Yeah. Unless he was just a dick and he just, I'm suspicious. I am too, kind of. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. Like like I said, this dude did exist. And, I mean, there are a lot of stories of him, like, coming into Phoenix and having a bunch of gold and stuff like that. So he did get that gold from somewhere. Yeah. They're just not sure if it actually okay. came from the place where it was supposed to have All come right. from. But so, eventually, he gets sicker and sicker. Then he gets a stroke. And, uh, he has a stroke, and then he's, like, paralyzed, and he can't really talk anymore. Now, even before he died... Julia and the two brothers, they decide, well, we're going to go into the superstitions and see if we can find what he said, so you know, from all the clues that he'd been talking about. So they were there for five weeks on their expedition, but didn't find anything. 
Now, Jacob Waltz died uh, in October of 1891. And after that point, like after his death, and then, you know, after all the legends around started kind of like seeping into the public consciousness, that's when they started calling it the Lost Dutchman Mine, even though, like I said, he's a German. So Julia Thomas, like I said, she had gone this one expedition that lasted five weeks. They didn't find anything. And she had kind of sunk all her money into it. And it was not fruitful. So she uh, never went back out there. Now, the two brothers that had saved him from the flood, apparently they got into like some kind of snippy little arguments because it's like, well, you should have like listened more to what Jacob Waltz was saying when he was dying and maybe he gave us a clue and you didn't write it down right or something like that. So they got into this big fight. Then they never like spoke again. Like, so that was like some big fight that they had. Um, and both of them actually start, went many times to the Superstition Mountains, like separately, like on separate expeditions looking for it. But of course, they never found anything either. Now, over the years since then, uh, many, many people have gone looking for it. And so far, none have been successful. Although I should say that I was on one website today, and I think it was just called LostDutchmanMind.com or something like that. And they said that they'd found it. But... I'm like skimming through there and I'm like, mm, I don't know. There's like, there's so many things that's people that say that they found it. They said they found it. They have photographs. I don't know. They have mm. photographs of something or other. I, ju I just think that a mine is a mine. That's it's what got I mean. Shafts. Did you find it? It goes did you somewhere. It? It's big. You know, that's what a mine is. Yeah. I kind of feel like every time somebody announced that they found it, I think it's just like they were sitting on their couch and they think they figured out a new thing. It was, it was thing right, right here. Map. It's right there here. it is. I don't have the money to go it's there or look or nothing. It's not how but it works. I kind of feel like that might be what yeah. the situation is. It's not how it works. Yeah. So, as I said, over the years, you know, the curse and the legend continues to grow because, you know, so many mysterious deaths and everything. Now... A few more of the stories that happened, like, after the death of Jacob Waltz. In the summer of 1880, there were uh, two guys. They had been soldiers. They were recently discharged from Fort McDowell. They show up in Pinal, Arizona, uh, at the Silver King Mine. They were looking for employment there. Now, they showed, uh, they had a bag of gold ore, and they showed it to the manager. And um, it was, like, really good shit, like I said. And he asked him, where the hell did you get that? And he said, oh, well, we found it while we were crossing Superstition Mountain, and we saw an old mine while we were passing through there. So the manager of this particular mine, the Silver King, um, was like, well, okay, that sounds like something I want to get involved in. So he bought the gold, not only bought the gold ore from the two guys, but he also, um, like, gave them some money to, uh, you know, buy supplies and stuff so they could go back out there, like all three of them could go back out there. So the two guys were like, yeah, we totally remember where that shit is. Yeah. Like guys do. <laughs> I know where that is. Trying to say they couldn't remember where it was. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> so the two guys go out there and go, yeah, we totally know where that is. They go out there uh, heading toward Weaver's Needle and they never return. Uh, so they're gone for two weeks and finally the manager's like, where the fuck did they go? So he sends a search party out after them. He finds their nude bodies, and both of them had been shot in the head. Doesn't make sense, the story. Why did they say they were going back to the mine? Because this uh, this other guy, like this manager of this other mine, like gave him a bunch of money and was like got into partnership with them and said, okay, we'll so go back. So they took the third guy? I don't okay. know if they took the third guy. I mean, it's not like they're gonna, they, had, they could I don't pull out their cell did. phones and go, here it is. Yeah. <laughs> you know I mean? didn't, that, that didn't sound right. You would think that he would, that, that he would want want them to take them back to the mine you know like yeah take me back to that mine that's what i thought was weird it's like why didn't the third guy go with them because right. doesn't sound right he could have just like given them a bunch of money for supplies and shit and then they'd be yeah. like yeah we're gonna go to the mine and See bring ya. you some gold back bye yeah but uh you know this, so they that story sounds fishy to me yeah so some like i said some of these sound believable and some of them sound fishy yeah. like so like people do go there looking for the shit and they do die and they do find their skeletons later on and they have yeah. found some skulls with like bullet holes in them and shit yeah. So somebody's murdering people out there. Right. But where's the mine? Right. You know. I don't know. No one's ever found it. It's right. just like that Oak Island shit, man. You got any more stories? Yeah, there's a few more. Okay. 
So why? What are we at? We're um, only at, we're only at thirty minutes. It's okay. It's <laughs> why are you it's trying okay. to you trying to rush me? No. Okay. I'm um, saying so we got time. Yeah. All right. So the year after that, there was this other guy. He was a prospector. His name was Joe Deering. Now he had been working as a bartender. Um. And he heard the, sto- the stories about those two guys, like, turning up dead around the mine. And he's like, well, I'm going to try and go look for that my own self. Now, he co- he goes out there, or so he tells everybody. And then when he comes back, he said that he found it. Um, he described it, uh, quote-unquote, as the most god-awful rough place you can imagine. And he also called it, quote-unquote, a ghostly place. Mm. Now, he started, he was still working as a bartender, and he started saving up money, like, to go out there for a full excavation, because he only just went, like, to look for the location, apparently. He didn't, like, blow anything up or nothing. So, um, he also worked at the same mine as the guy from the previous story, the Silver King mine, um, and he went to work there for extra money, and then it turned out (laughs) that a week after he started working at that mine for extra money to go back out of the superstitions... He got killed in a cave-in. Now, so we, there's that curse again. Do we know these are real people? Some of them are, yeah. Well, okay. at least some of them are, okay. because they have records of them, like and, I said. Okay, there are records of these people. Do we know if the story, the, were the stories verified? Do we know that, or are these just... Some of them, like, some of them, yeah, but, like, some of them are, you know, have been... Because there's a couple things in that story that kind of stick out to me. Yeah. He comes back and says, oh, I know where it is. Boy, it's in a rough place. You know what I mean? That mm-hmm. shit's terrible. You know? Well, that... That right there is kind of like a sideways excuse. You say, I found it. Other people couldn't find it because it's really rough to get in there. Yeah. That's why other people aren't finding it. That's why people can't find this thing. But not really. Because what you do is you find the roughest place you can find on the map, and that's where it is. Yeah. It sounds like a story to me. Well, here's the thing. If I, like, not that I'm going to do this or anything. If there was a mine that was hidden. It's more likely that it's in a totally nondescript place that has no description and doesn't stick out at all. Well, yeah. You know what I mean? Because if it was somewhere easy, like, oh, in the shadow of Weaver's Needle, you'd think millions of people would have found it by now because that's like, that's a specific place. But if it's a hole in the ground in a flat plain somewhere, it's hard to describe that. And you wouldn't be attracted to it. Yeah, if there are no landmarks around it. There's no real landmarks around it or anything. So that last one about being in a really rough place and boy phew you know I'm not buying that it's like boy that's because you would because a place like that would stick out and would be checked yeah you know well yeah like I said anything with like any kind of like yeah standout landmarks any 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 unusual features would be checked because it attracts your attention yeah so that means over the time if this mine wasn't found it wasn't found because it's in a place that is unremarkable yeah if it's there. If it's yeah. there, it's going to be in a place that is unremarkable. That no one even thought to check. Right. That's what I'm thinking. Because just statistically. That's probably a good point. Because yeah. another thing, too, is like I always feel like, especially back in the old gold prospecting days, yeah. uh, considering how competitive that fucking shit was, it's like if you were out there in the mountains... and you came across like a super rich like vein of gold or something like that, I would not tell anybody yeah. about that shit. If that mine's there, I think it's in a place that is very nondescript, that doesn't have any terrain features around it, and you have to stumble upon it by pure luck, by pure chance. In other words, it's in the middle of flat, open ground somewhere. Yeah. And maybe because of, you know, for one reason or another, there's a it's just a hole that goes straight down to the ground. Yeah. You know what I mean? But I can't, I can't imagine a fucking mine looking like that. You know what I mean? Mine usually has to have tracks or a or, or a structure to hold it up because you know what I mean. As you're digging, you're trying to stop cave ins and stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's usually not something that just goes straight down into the ground unless it's just an open pit mine. Somebody's just digging. You know what I mean? Yeah. But it just it just sounds fishy to me. Well, yeah, and like I said, a lot of these sound fishy because it seems like a lot of the dudes that go in there. And then they come back out going, yeah, I found that shit. Why the fuck would you come out of the mountains and go, yeah, I totally found it? Yeah. I'm like, you were just practically begging back, particularly back in those days. Begging to get killed. You're begging to get killed or tortured yeah. for somebody to like, tell where the fuck is it? I, like I said, I would keep mum about that shit. 
And, you know, a mine is something that's dug. We're not talking about a cave. Yeah. You know what I mean? So. I don't know. Like, I think when they say Lost Dutchman Mine, I think they're talking about, like, a natural. They're talking about a natural mine, like a cave? Yeah, like a natural mine or, like, a natural gold vein, like a really rich gold vein. Yeah, I don't know what they're talking about. I don't think they're talking about a mine like a man-made mine. Because that nobody says, I mean, nowadays, like, when people go out there looking for it, it's like they go out there with dynamite and all this other kind of shit. But I don't think that they mean, like, okay. that so back then it was about... a man-made mine. I think they mean it's, like, a natural Okay, I was, th- gold I was vein. thinking that they were talking about, like, an abandoned... They're just, they just call it that. Man, the lost man-made, man-made mine. mine. They got abandoned somewhere. All Mm-mm. right. Okay. Yeah, I think they're just talking about, like, They're talking about just a place where this gold is. Yeah. I think how that... do you recognize it? That's what I mean. I think if they just ended not, up calling it that because that was the easiest thing to call it. And then he's like, oh, I know where it is. Yeah, sure you do. Where's the gold? Yeah, like I said, why the fuck would you say that to... Well, yeah. why, even if you did even if you did find it, why would you tell anybody? I wouldn't tell anybody. If you found it, you'd think you could, could knock some gold out of the wall, right? Put it in a bag and bring it with you. Cash in. In case you couldn't find it again, right? Well, yeah, that'd be the first thing you would right, do. Yeah. Like, get as much as you could get. And they're right. And I mean, even then, like, I'd be scared, yeah. like, you go into town and, like, you cash it in and everybody like, where'd you get that? Oh, I don't know. I just found it. Like, yeah. It was just laying around. I think anybody <laughs> showing up saying, I think anybody showing up saying, I know where it is and they don't have gold in their hands, I wouldn't believe it. Yeah. Now, like, the they're other, showing off. Now, the other guy, the other guys who, who had gold and, get, and sold it to the other miner, it was in a bag. Yeah. So that means that they just found a bag of gold. They found a bag of gold, or they could have bought it from someone else, or there's yeah. a lot of possibilities right. in that situation. They didn't necessarily have to that find it. That doesn't mean it. they knew where the mine was. <laughs> right. Yeah, there's a lot of other places you yeah. could get gold. Okay, is there any more? That yeah, there's like, yeah, lots of stories. This year. Okay. So here's another story, and this one is about uh, a prospector whose name was Alicia Marcus Rebus, and they called him the madman of the superstitions. Okay. Now this guy, I mean... Eventually, like, I guess, like, before, he had been, like, a school teacher. So he was, like, college educated and everything like that. But he, um, he had actually started out, uh, like I said, he was teaching. But then during the gold rush, he went out to California and, like, started looking for gold. But he didn't really find any anything out there. So in the 1860s, he moved to Arizona. And he was kind of living out in the mountains. And he kind of turned into, like... You know, he had the patented, like, Old Testament hermit kind of thing yeah. going with, like, the big old beard and, like, he was Became all... Became Jeremiah Johnson. Yeah, Johnson, yeah exactly. Johnson. He, he was, like, all fucking Jeremiah crazy Jeremiah Johnson, Johnson Johnston. Yeah. Yeah. We need to do a show about Jeremiah Johnson. I thought... Did we or were we just talking about it? I think we were just it? talking about Because I, I remember we, we were talking about doing it and that was a long time ago. I and then I thought did. we had done it, but I guess we didn't do one, did we? The legendary Jeremiah Johnson. We probably should. Liver eating Johnson. Yeah, that's what they called him. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I can only I can only hope that one day. I'll I don't think we did a show. On. I think we we're just talking about. Yeah, it. I think we were talking about doing a show yeah. about that. So yeah, so apparently this guy, like I said, he had the whole hermit thing going. He had like the big beard. He would run around naked in the mountains and like fire his gun into the sky and shit like that. Um, also, but this had the added benefit, and maybe this is why he was doing it, I don't know, that apparently the Apache were kind of scared of him because they thought he was a nutcase. Yeah. So, uh, so they kind of left him alone. So there was, there was a plus in that situation. So, um, all right. So again, he lived like kind of around the Superstition Mountains. And, uh, I don't know if he knew where the mine was, but, you know, he did talk about it at some point. But they did find him, uh... In 1896, uh, I guess his friends said, hey, where'd that crazy hermit guy go? And they go in there to look for him. And then they found him about four miles south of his house, like in this, uh, on a trail near Rogers Canyon, and his head had been cut off. So again... Apaches got him. Yeah, so I guess the Apaches got him. Apaches got him. Cut your fucking head off. I guess so. That's some bad shit when you cut a motherfucker's head off. (laughs) You must be pretty mad when you do that. I yeah, I've always yeah. been kind of like, I've always been fascinated by like decapitation in a weird kind of way. <laughs> no, like I was reading this one thing because when I was growing up, I read about um, you know Mary Queen of Scots mm-hmm. and she got be- when she got beheaded, and the story I heard I don't know how true this is, but the story I heard was that when they went to behead her because they, before they had the guillotine and all that, 
they just had to do it with a fucking axe, which, yeah. you know, might not have been all that sharp. They were blunt, yeah. Yeah, and they were pretty blunt. So, apparently, she's in a, she went outside, she was, like, inside, and she had, like, her red dress on and everything. And, apparently, the executioner, like, kind of missed the first, like, he didn't miss miss, but he missed, like, cutting her head off. So, it's like he just kind of, like, chunked into her shoulder or something like that, because, I don't know, I guess he'd been, like, drinking the night before or whatever. And, um, so, but it didn't kill her. And I was like, that, when I was a kid, that fucking horrified me. Because I'm yeah. like, can you imagine? It's bad enough that you're, like, laying there with your head on a, pl- on a block, wait, knowing that you're going to get your head chopped off in a second. And then, like, you just think, okay, you're going to get it over with. And then it didn't even do it. Yeah. And then he has to, like, do it again. Have you ever seen a video of beheading? Ugh, yeah. I've seen it, too. Over in Saudi Arabia, they're beheading people during those executions. It's horrifying. They do a lot of screaming. They had one where this girl, this woman was accused of killing she was like a nanny accused of uh killing the baby that she was watching i don't know all the details but she was begging for mercy trying to run from this guy and they were holding her down they looked kind of sympathetic they didn't look like they wanted to do it they took her head off of that damn arabic sword and what was funny is it didn't take much strength that that sword must have been super sharp because he just went like it was like a little pussy hit Either that her heads and, and, aren't and attached as... Her head just came right off. ...stringently as we yeah, would he like to believe. I was expecting him to like really bow up and put a fucking samurai slice into it. No, it was just kind of like chop. End of that blade maybe move four feet, maybe three feet. That's horrible. Just, and her head would... Sh- to me, that just like seemed like... Yeah. Uh, that and getting eaten by a shark are like <laughs> some of the yeah. worst things I can think of. I don't know. It looked pretty quick to me. I mean, but uh, yeah. But see, the thing what is, what sucked is that she was trying to roll away from it, going no, 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 no. <laughs> and two or three yeah. guys holding her down. You know what God, I mean? Can you imagine? And can you imagine that, knowing that that's going to happen? Yeah, to yeah. You? She's trying to. She's trying to get away. And Jesus she's got Christ. that damn veil on. You know that? What, what's that thing that they wear? Yeah. Kept, uh, you know what I'm talking about? She's got that on. He's trying to figure out where the neck is. You know, and he finally, and it just boom, rolls right off. Yikes. Yeah, this is something else, man. Well, and also, you know, for a long time, especially, you know, before, right before and after they invented the guillotine, yeah. they were, like, super into, like, doing all these experiments to see how long your head would live, like, after it got cut off. It does live. Yeah, and yeah. I, I'm kind of like, you know, it's not like you can, like, do an experiment on that, like, ethically. Yeah. <laughs> Let's cut off people's heads and yeah. see, like, hey, how many fingers am I holding up? Like, that's horrible. But it's like, it did look like people's eyes and shit like Open, that were reacting yeah. for at least like 20 seconds or something. It takes a long time for the Wasn't brain. it like 20 seconds, 30 seconds, something yeah, like that? Yeah, but it takes, a long long time enough. For, it takes a long time for the brain to starve of oxygen. So chances are they could be kind of semi-conscious for, <sighs> a, for a God, long time. Wouldn't that be horrible? It's probably several minutes, but I think I think the trauma, the psychological trauma I, I would hope so. of being beheaded causes you to pass out, I think. And also, you got to understand that blood pressure would fucking... Would drop, Would sure. drop instantly. So I'm not sure if you could maintain like consciousness, consciousness like, for very long. Not full consciousness. Maybe a few seconds. Uh, you know, if still, that. though. God. That, just, that yeah. kind of shit gives me fucking nightmares. Yeah. Even, like, five seconds of, like, realizing that you were just ahead would be just, like, God, that'd be the fucking worst. Yeah, and then you take the head and you show it the body. Look. Man. Right. Oh, God. I know, that's what I mean. Oh, that's fucking horrible. This is what, like that story about Mary Queen of Scots and the yeah, whole yeah. scene from The Omen where fucking David Warner gets his head chopped off with a pane of glass. It's like, even though it looks kind of fakey now and stuff like that, oh, that traumatized me so bad. When, when you're a kid, kid, yeah. Ugh. Evidently, that one guy that Yet I also kind of find it That one find doctor, kind of Greg, too. The, 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 the best account I've heard was there was a French doctor who at, at the guillotine reached down into that into the basket into the basket and got the head yeah and he said the eyes were closed yeah but he called the guy's name and, and the eyes and the opened eyes opened and looked at him and he made yeah contact. I remember that story he made eye contact with him for a second but then the eyes closed again so man <laughs> damn did you ever think we were just talking about like gold mines and then just now <laughs> yeah. we're talking about like fucking heads knowing if they've been cut that's off it is and this, shit that's the way it is in this house <laughs> and now I'm like it's now really, I'm gonna have nightmares thanks nah. a lot about being beheaded. Yikes. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So uh, let me see. Let's see if I have any more stories about people that went looking for this shit. Okay. So um, around 1900, okay, they so were this is getting a little bit newer. Yeah. So there were two more. Yeah. Like kind of the most famous 
you know, one that kind of cemented in the public consciousness. Actually, it didn't happen until the 30s. But, uh, yeah, so it's about 1900. There's two prospectors. Uh, their names were Malm and Silverlock. And they started working around the northern edge of Superstition Mountain. Um, they found um, a little bit of gold, uh, but not so much in the mountain itself. I think I heard that they found, like, some little leftover nuggets from when the Peralta family was massacred, like, what we, all the all those years ago. You know, because, like I said, when the Apaches killed them and, like, kind of the gold got scattered everywhere. So they apparently found some of that, but didn't really find that much in the mountain. Uh, so 1910, Mom turns up in Mesa, Arizona and tells everybody his partner, Silverlock, was trying to kill him. And then Silverlock gets arrested. Uh, he gets, and then he gets uh, an insanity play, like they call him insane. They send him to like some poor farm or like some fucking asylum or something like that. And then both of them later died. Now, also in that same year, they actually found a skeleton of a woman. And this was in a cave, like way up on the, in the mountain. And next to the body, they found like a whole bunch of gold nuggets. Hmm. Now, they said, I don't know how they could tell this, but they said her death was fairly recent, but they couldn't tell where the gold had come from or how she had died or anything. So I don't know if she actually found some gold in the mountain. Then, Or like, she died next to some nuggets. Or she just... <laughs> every time we say nuggets, I was thinking like chicken, chicken nuggets. nuggets. <laughs> she died next to a pile of chicken yeah. nuggets. <laughs> Hungry as shit. Just fucking nuggets. I can't, I can't get to them. <laughs> nugs. I can't get to the nugs. <laughs> We're so silly. Yeah. <laughs> now, another story goes that in 1927, there was a guy from New Jersey and his sons, and they were hiking through the Superstition Mountains when boulders started rolling down on them. It looked like someone was pushing boulders down on them. You know what I mean? Yeah. So. This was 1927, so I don't know if there's like still Apaches up there in the no, fucking mountains, sounds like, like a story. pushing rocks down on them or anything like that. Sounds like some. This just sounds like a story. Go yeah, ahead. probably. Like I said, there's a lot of stories about these yeah. mountains. They don't call them the superstitions for nothing. Right. So now, I, what? Growing up in California, all right, Sierra Nevada mountains. As a kid, a lot of ravines and crevices and shit like that. You know, we always had this innate fear of boulders boulders are a meme you know what i mean but in reality we walked around all day long and no boulders ever fucking came down on us I, boulder boulders are a meme i would have thought that you probably would have yeah. got that more from like looney tunes cartoons yeah that's, like, that's where it comes from, from the coyote like yeah, pushing yeah, him down trying yeah. to push him down on the road yeah, runner. Seen boulders all the time <laughs> boulders are mostly a meme you don't just walk around and get hit by boulders. Well, who could even like put? No one could push a boulder up. So, yeah, I mean, they, they do fall, they do fall off. I guess sometimes. you can push a boulder because it's on a slope. True. To, to begin with, you know, and we may not be talking about a big boulder. You know, we're like talking it's a big. I, I guess it does. Boulder doesn't have to be that big. Doesn't have to be that big. Yeah. <laughs> doesn't have to be a wily coyote. Because people are just so boulder. little and squishable. Well, we're not talking about a wily coyote boulder. You know, <laughs> the size of a house. We're talking about. Something that's, you know, five feet in diameter. You know, you can push that down the side of a hill. Usually it's connected to something, but if you push on it, it'll fall. Yeah. But half the time we used to play with them, they were just more like dried, big old hard packed mud things. And as they rolled, they got smaller, breaking up. Yeah. Those are the ones, those are the, did you ever, those are our, quote, boulders, end did, quote. Did you ever push one off of a cliff? Oh, yeah. Did yeah. you kill anybody? No. Oh. How do no. you know? Because... Because we were kids, we couldn't get up on a high cliff. We're talking about, you know, I mean, okay. a cliff that was only maybe thirty feet tall, or you know. Because wouldn't that be sand. shitty if you were just like kids and you were playing up and you like knocked a boulder off and then you ended yeah. up just like killing a motherfucker without no. even made wherever it those it. boulders Oops. were, there wasn't anything that that could get hurt. You know what I mean? You weren't around roads or anything, playing around inside the Mojave Desert and shit. You know, camping. Yeah. It's that kind of stuff. Blowing shit up. Blowing shit up. Yes. <laughs> Shooting lizards with a BB gun. You did not. All kinds of lizards with a oh, BB gun. Oh, you lizards. suck. Killing them, too. Don't kill the lizards. They you, didn't you do used, nothing to you. I was a kid, you know what I mean? You were supposed to kill lizards back then. You know, That's what BB guns were for. Couldn't you just, like, shot Shoot your, them and they fucking jump friend, up in the air and hit the ground. Hit the ground stiff as a board, you know, going, uh, vibrating oh. from it. Had a dog with me and then the dog would eat them. 
Yeah. That, that sucks. Yeah. Dog would eat them, though. So at least some good came yeah, of it. Yeah, dog would eat, eat the shit out of them. <laughs> I had a black Labrador at the time. I mean, I everything. guess we can't really say because, like, Pookie kills lizards yeah, all yeah. the time. Yeah, dog we, just eat We it. try to, like, keep her from doing it. Yes. Yeah. Okay, you know what her latest thing is? Check this shit out. She's our kitty is like a genius. So, well, for she's a kitty. For a cat, yeah. Well, what she does is like when she goes out on the back porch, like we try to get her not to play with lizards because she doesn't try to kill them. She she's kills just playing everyone with them, but she yeah. ends up killing them just because she's like you know pawing them shit. So, but what she's trying to do now since. Tom always takes the lizards away from her yeah, and, like, and yells in. at her. So she tries to bring them inside to no, play with, but she them. knows that Tom doesn't want her to bring them inside. She so is. what she started doing now is like, she'll hide it in her mouth. She'll like stick it in her mouth. And then like, she'll claw on the door. Like, Oh my God, let me in, let me in, let me in. And then yeah. you let her in. And then she runs like really fast, like out yeah. of the room and yeah. like into, and then she goes and hides yeah. because she knows that if we see that she has a lizard, that we'll yeah. take it away. You got to check that mouth. So as soon as, if she comes in and like runs, you got to chase her and be like, what's yeah. in your mouth? Because she yeah. always, finding, she's, she's super sneaky. Finding guys. lizards, finding lizards in the house, dead lizards in the house. Yeah. Another day yeah. I got up and she was like sitting out in the, out in the front room and she was sitting there looking at me and she had her paw on a dead lizard like that. Like, look what I did. Yeah. I got this shit in here and y'all didn't even see yeah. me. Yeah. You got to She'll kill those tree frogs too. Yeah. We found many dead frogs yeah. in the house. That's like really well. Oh no, I forgot that that squirrel was that her or that might have been the bigger cat. We don't know. She'll body slam squirrels. Yeah, we found a headless squirrel on the porch one night. Yeah, one Beijing, Beijing ate the ate, ate that squirrel eventually. Yeah, Beijing ate, the ate, bigger ate cat. a lot of it. Yeah, she ate a lot of it. It was super gross. <laughs> <laughs> pulled the head off of it and the guts and shit. That was the grossest it. shit. Like she then killed. She threw it up. Yeah, she did. I mean, she's she's brought us like moles and stuff, yeah. but I think that was like the first time moles and gr- gr- uh, gophers and gophers. Yeah, but that was the first time I'd ever seen a squirrel and like yeah. th- bring her bring a squirrel and first time that it didn't have a head. It was like there was guts hanging out of her. Baby Cookie was bragging, was trying to trying to convince me she, that she killed. that She was squirrel. trying to claim the kill. Yeah, I'm not. I don't think that she killed that squirrel. She's though. like, look, Daddy, look. She kept picking it up and body slamming. Look what I did. Pow. Look and then pick it back up and pow. I'm a well, master hunter. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah. That's what I mean. She's really smart. Yeah. She, she's smart enough to, like, try to deceive us. Yeah. <laughs> I think Beijing killed that squirrel. Probably, like I said. Yeah. Baby Cookie seems like she's not much bigger than a squirrel herself. Yeah. She's no, still she's pretty bigger small. than a squirrel. She's about no, I said she's, she's not the size much. of a large rabbit. Yeah. She's, yeah. Still, she's small for a cat, though. Yeah. She's a manx, small. though. Yeah, they I think... The, well, they don't get big for five years. Five years. I don't. Yeah. They don't get to full size until five years, and she's only two. All right, let's get back to the show. These people are getting bored of. <laughs> what well, was everybody likes talking about the kitties? Okay. <laughs> All right. So now, probably the event that cemented the lost Dutchman mine into American public consciousness and into like the legendary status that it has today happened in 1931, and this dealt with a dude named Adolf Ruth who was a veterinarian from Washington DC and he also had a side hustle like looking for treasure so now he supposedly had a map now his son had supposedly got this map in Mexico several years before and it supposedly came from the time of the Mexican Revolution Um, they later called this the Ruth Peralta map so he was actually looking for the Peralta mines that the Peralta family had had that, like I said, they had a gold mine and several silver mines. So, um, and and also the lost Dutchman mine, because those might've been two separate things. So he supposedly had this map that he had. So he goes there in, uh, in May of 1931 and he gets like a couple of guides and they go around in, in the summer and they go into the mountains looking for the shit. Now, they don't hear anything from Adolf Ruth for six days. And so someone goes out looking for him, who was like, you know, the guide, uh, the guide peoples. He sent like two cowboys out there like they were guides. So that that dude, the boss, like went out looking for them. So they go out and they find a camp, but they don't find anyone at it. So they report, uh, they report him missing and they keep looking around for the next like month and a half or something like that. And they don't find anything. 
Now, in December of 1931, they find a skull with two holes in it. And this was later determined to belong to Adolf Ruth. Hmm. Now, they didn't find the rest of him until about a month later, and that was like in a little river. Uh, they found the rest of his body. But they also found his treasure map, and it was still at his campsite. So, like, no one had taken it or anything. So they're not entirely sure... He was killed away from his camp. That he was killed away he, from his and camp. And he wasn't robbed. He was killed just for being where he was. Yeah. So I don't think that what whoever... was this again? 1931. Okay. Shot twice in the head. It looked like. Hmm. Um, you know, he ran afoul. I guess so. And then somebody beheaded him. But like I said, it didn't seem... Either that or... I mean, I guess because the body and the head were found so far apart. Because I was going to say it was scattered by animals. But I think that it was such a big distance. Sounds like a beheading. Yeah, it was such a big distance, it sounds like a beheading. Now, um, so all the stuff that came out in the newspapers about it, of course, like made this big deal about, oh, he got murdered for the map. And, you know, he really knew where the mine was and all this other kind of shit. Um, but there was, uh, there was also some speculation about, oh, maybe he wasn't murdered. Like maybe those weren't actually bullet holes. Although, like I said, how does his head and body get so far apart unless somebody murdered him? Seriously. Right. And like, what else are those big two holes going to be? Like if you just fell off a mountain or something, it's not holes. It's, you know, it's all busted up. It's not like, you know what I mean? He was shot. I feel like he was probably shot and beheaded. Like you said. Yeah. So, you know, there we go. No, uh, <laughs> that didn't have anything to do with that treasure, though. I'm telling you. Well, like I said, he said he had a map for it, but I don't think that the they murder after didn't. That map. Obviously, because they didn't take yeah. it, right. they still found it. That it was back so in I his fucking campsite. He may have been killed, but I think it was unrelated to him looking for that treasure. Exactly. So you know, as I said, that was kind of like the one that, like I said, cemented the legend into the American. Since that time, many, 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 many people have gone into the Superstition Mountains looking for the Lost Dutchman Mine. Some have not returned. Some have been found later in skeletal form. Um, but as of today, no one has found this mine. No one has found any gold in the Superstition Mountains. There has been, like I said, there were gold mines around there and shit like that, but. Like I said, a lot of experts say that if there is a mine there, it's not in the superstitions because it's not the kind, or if it's, if there's gold there, it's not in the superstitions because it's not the right kind of rock. So what, what do, do you, you think, Jenny? Honestly, I probably think, like I said, there have been gold mines around that similar area, but as far as the iconic lost Dutchman gold mine, the one in the superstition mountain, like there's supposedly this really rich vein. I don't think it's there. I it's mean, alleged. I mean, it's possible, obviously, it's because it's a big place and it's like, yeah, people have been looking for it for, you know, decades and decades, like, you know, since since Jacob Waltz supposedly found gold there. Yeah. But you'd think someone would have come yeah. across something by In now. In this modern era of GPS and fucking internal combustion engines and four-wheelers and three-wheelers, fucking park rangers, and just this over this amount of time it would have been found, this... This is a legend, and it was either based on a lie or a misunderstanding. Probably a lie. Somebody had some gold, and then they lied about where they got it. That's probably what started this. I kind of feel like that might have been the issue. And that might have been what Waltz was doing, because like I said, you know, I don't know if this is a legend or not, but the dude did exist. It's like apparently he did come into Phoenix, and he had a bunch of really high-grade ore that he was paying for shit with, but... Did he get that from the Superstition Mountains? He may have got that off. The he might have got it somewhere else. He might have gotten that from another, but from, from from somebody else that he had killed. Right, and then that's what made I mean. that story up. Oh, I found it out of the thing out. Well, there. yeah, because that's a better and story the, than yeah, hey, I killed better, a right. good dude and took killed all this shit. dude and took his gold. Man. <laughs> you know what I mean? He got it in California. You know, that's yeah, probably maybe he what did. it was. Somebody somebody got it out of Cal out of California during the gold rush killed that dude on the road and took that shit and made up a story of where he found it. And That's the, more likely. The thing about a lot of these gold mines, too, and like they, I think they mentioned this a little bit on the In Search Of show that I was watching, was that it, particularly during the gold rush, it's like towns would, you know, if somebody found a vein of gold a somewhere, town would spring up a town would spring up like overnight, overnight. pretty much, and, and there'd be like 10, 20,000 people there suddenly, yeah. and then when it dried up, Two everyone years would later, just leave. Gone. Called, yeah, and then, like, the whole thing would be gone. It's a ghost be, town. It'd be called a ghost town, and there's only one of them still surviving. There's a ghost town that found, they found out there in California. I think it was California. And it's now a national park. 
But there's was, one in Arizona around here too. It's called Goldfield. Is there? Yeah. yeah. There, was, there was one of them that was found kind of recently, like in the '60s, I think. When, if memory serves, it might not mind. That they found are like, man, look at this. This is a town. Yeah. And it was a gold rush town. <laughs> Who knew? And it was just sitting out there by itself, by itself. You know, there weren't any roads. Modern roads weren't connected to it. And I, I can't really remember. I think it was found in the '50s or the '60s. I think I know but, what you're talking about because didn't we see something about that? Like yeah, some documentary and it's some intact. Story? That's it's in, pretty spooky. It's, it's intact. It had furniture in it. It's not very big, but it had furniture in it and glass windows and, and everything. But uh, you can go tour it now. Yeah. You know, the, the park the park service took over it. Uh, Same care, thing with superstition. And like I said, as far as I know, the town of Goldfield, um, which is a ghost town now too in Arizona, which is not far from the Superstition Mountains, um, as far as I know, they've made a national park out of all of that. Like, you can tour it and stuff, but you're technically not allowed to go treasure hunting there. Although some people still do yeah. on the sly. Because some people are just convinced that there's got to be gold out there somewhere. Because, like I said, some people have come back from there with gold and claimed that that's where they found it. Yeah. Ghost it's towns. It's possible. Ghost sure. towns. That's a, that's, it's, that's a, it's an American phenomenon of the old West. <laughs> town appear out of nowhere run for about three or four years and then run out of money and vanish yep and there was no reason to go there well yeah because once like i said the whole reason it was there because somebody found gold like in an area and everybody's gonna go look for it or they or i think in some cases they claimed they found gold there and they invested a bunch of money and there was no gold and then there. there wasn't any and two three years later people just left and it's just or sometimes they did find gold and they'd be like, it oh, it's this out. big rich vein, but, but it ran out. Yeah, it wasn't yeah, yeah. as big it wasn't as they, what they thought. thought it was. So, you know, I, I feel like that might have been a case here. It's I, I feel like, like it, it because this after the story took over, like after Jacob Waltz died and after this whole thing about the map and all the other kind of stuff, I just I just feel like the story kind of took on a life of its own. So maybe dude did find gold there or somewhere around there, but, and like I said, you know, it's possible that there could be gold around there because, you know, the Apache had legends about gold being in the mountains, even like way before that happened, like even before the Spaniards got there, but. I think the legend was solidified when somebody showed up with gold saying, I got it out of there. Now pay me for this gold, but that's not where that gold came from. Maybe not. He stole the gold or killed somebody for the gold or you know got it at a very remote location and didn't want to say where it was you know and then that started this cycle of lying about this gold in that and mountain. something that i found i happens, bet you there's no gold in those mountains there might not be like uh, i said yeah. because it's not the right kind of rock but yeah. um something that is interesting to me about a lot of these legends and i think and i can't remember what uh subject we were talking about but there was another thing that happened with this was that Sometimes if a story about a place develops like later on, like sometimes shit happened before that will be backdated to like fit into the modern story. You know what I mean? So I don't know if that's the case here because maybe there's the whole thing about Jacob Waltz and he came out of the Superstition Mountains of Gold and then they kind of backdated it to say, oh, the Apache had all this, all these stories about gold in there and the Spaniards and all this other kind of stuff. So I I I don't know. He's not buying it. Because the Apaches knew that gold was valuable. They knew all about gold. Yeah. Those Apaches would have been all over that area and they'd have that gold in their hands. Be trading guns for it. And yeah, wealth. you think. Yeah, yeah. If there was gold there, the Apaches would know. Every time I read about like gold prospectors and stuff like that, I can't help but hear like Yosemite Sam's voice going, Gold! Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know why that is. Yeah, but Too the, many Looney Tunes cartoons when I was growing up, I all, guess. All of these, uh, all of these stories kind of hinge on the fact that the Indians didn't value gold. Total bullshit. The Indians got valued gold. Yeah. The, that, 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 they, uh, that they would just leave it where yeah, it was. Yeah, no, no, the Indians not, valued like, gold. They knew, gold was money. Indians understood what money was. Well, yeah, like I said, they weren't dumb. If they had, yeah, like, this shit wasn't that the 15, they could... This wasn't the 1500s. Yeah. This is the 1800s and 1700s. They knew what gold was. Yeah, I kind of feel like there's probably, you know yeah. what I mean? It's, I, I kind of feel like there's nothing there. I, I know that I understand, like, the kind of magic of, like, these people that like to go treasure, not just for gold mines, but that go looking for, like, pirate wrecks and stuff like that. Because, I don't know, it's the same thing that, like, keeps people gambling, I guess. It's like, you know, you're probably not going to win, but if you luck out, it's, like, going to be this big, 
deal. The thing is, though, if you if you go looking for gold in the Superstition Mountains, that's owned by the government now. So even if you found anything, you, you can't can keep, keep it. it. Yeah. So why bother looking? Plus, it's like really inhospitable territory to go looking for gold. It's probably better to go look. Memory in the serves ocean. in the modern era. There've been all kinds of guys fucking trying to find the gold and then actually going looking for it. It's a park now. Are they even allowed to go walking around there now? You, I think you can go walking around, but like you're not allowed to go in there. Like it would have been found by now. It's, there's no gold there. I don't think there is either. No. I don't think there is either. No. But it's like, I like all the stories, though, because yeah. I love these kind of, like, romanticized... Good stories. Yeah. Good oh. stories, but there's no gold there. The no. story was based on... The... So don't go look in there, because no. you'll probably just, like, die. Nah. And you'll, there's you'll no just, gold there. You'll just, like, die of thirst or whatever, or exposure. Yeah. <laughs> so don't go look in there's nothing there. Buy a lottery ticket. It's a lot cheaper. <laughs> All right, so that will wrap up our show about the Lost Dutchman Mine and the Superstition Mountains. Hope you guys enjoyed our rambling, drunken discussion. <laughs> if you didn't, then whatever. You didn't it's have to. Be all right. You didn't have to listen. I don't it's know. Be all right. I don't They're know working. why you did. Yeah. <laughs> Good show. Yeah, but anyway, uh, remember if you like the show, like, share, subscribe. It really helps us out a lot. Um, if you'd like to financially support the show, we have a Patreon page, which you can find at 13 o'clock podcast, or you can give us a donation on Patreon, uh, PayPal rather. Uh, you can find the link on our blog, which is 13 o'clock podcast.wordpress.com. There's a little button that says PayPal in the sidebar. If you'd like to give a one-time donation, if you don't like Patreon for whatever reason, remember our, uh, oh, and also if you're a patron, you get to see all our shows a day early. So that might be a thing that you're into. And remember our regular episodes every Tuesday. Movie retrospectives, which is old movies, that's every Friday. And new movies in the theater or on Netflix or on Shudder uh, are every Sunday. We do three of them. So check them all out if you haven't already. And that'll do it for episode 157. We will see you next time. Bye.